Hello, welcome to the October 26, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test and we'll make sure everything is going as expected. Hello, welcome to the October 26. Okay, everything sounds fine on my monitoring computer. My name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. Uh, I work as a product specialist for Yamaha Corporation of America, uh, primarily focusing on Steinberg products. Um, and and I'm based out of uh, Washington, D.C. area in the United States, uh, just in Alexandria, Virginia. So um, if you are watching this live stream live, please feel free to tell us who you are and feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, how the live stream works is you can ask questions in the live chat field or you could submit questions in advance by sending it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, and we'll try to get through all the questions uh, chronologically. My ability to answer questions um, uh, in a real-time manner, uh, I won't be able to keep up. So at certain points, I may be 30 to 45 minutes behind the live questions. I'm going to try my best to, to catch up, but we want to answer each question as uh, thoroughly and succinctly as possible. So if we could try to avoid ask, if you don't see an immediate response to your question, if we could try to avoid asking uh, the same question repeatedly, that would only just slow down the whole process and not allow us to get through more questions. So if we could try that, that would be appreciated. When asking questions, if you could indicate which version and the level of Cubase, so you could say I'm running Cubase Elements, I'm running Cubase Elements, uh, on you know 10.5 or version 11 i'm running it on a, on mac os or windows that information is helpful as well so um and as we do this i before we get started i want to give special thanks to some people that help out with the community so uh we have we will have probably later tonight several hours after the live stream all of the topics covered in the live stream should be posted into uh, and pinned to the top of the comments field on the, um, you know, in the live stream. So look for that. But if you wanted to search for other, um, if you wanted to search for other topics uh, that have been covered probably in previous live streams, I think Jan from uh, CubaseIndex.com, he's on the live stream and he was kind enough to send me an email. Uh, that I think we have like 13,400 some questions uh, that we've gone through since kind of pandemic started in March of last year. So, but you could search there for uh, questions that might've been covered in previous live streams. So thanks to Jan for doing that. We also have two people that serve as moderators. We usually have a well-behaved group, but since we are a popular live stream, sometimes people will just put in some nefarious ads. So. Uh, they usually do a great job on that. So special thanks to a uh, Agent K and Jazz Dude for uh, volunteering their time to moderate. They're not Steinberg employees. They just kind of do it out of the kindness of their hearts and to help the community. Another wonderful uh, resource of information uh, you could check out is kind of uh, the Cubase Nation Discord. And Jazz Dude does a lot of work with that. So special thanks to Jazz Dude again for all of his efforts and uh, helping the community here. So um, during the live stream, my family is at home. So you may hear uh, my son it will be getting back from school probably during the last 30 minutes. So he may interrupt and you may hear my wife who's working directly above me. So I apologize for any interruptions or just little household noises you may hear. But let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to break off my chat field so I can see it a little better here. Okay, so we see a question from Alex. Um, Hi, I want to know how to avoid after the different voice recordings, the stacking of voice recordings in the assignment after selecting interesting parts, but I still want to keep these unused recordings. So it just sounds like maybe you want to learn how to maybe how to comp parts. So let's say if I did a recording here and I had multiple recordings on this particular track. 
we could open up what we call lanes. And when we look at our lanes, we could see that we have kind of different takes here. And we have a special tool for this. It looks like the hand, and this is a comp tool. So we have, let's say one, we have six different recordings. So if I wanted to listen to different tracks, I could just kind of click on the recording. Now let's say I wanted to find kind of maybe the, you know, different parts of different sections. I could just grab the comp tool and if I wanted to audition, I could hold down the control or command key. It's so, okay, I want that. And this way I could just kind of select in a particular lane without having to cut. Um, so I could come here and I could select different events, kind of like so. So like as we work on it, and we can say this represents my perfect recording of all of these different parts. And then if we wanted to, we could just collapse the lanes. So we could see that we're gonna have the different sections of each of the recordings, but we haven't discarded those other recordings in case you wanted to use them later or someone's like, oh, I really like the phrasing of this as opposed to this one. They're still available. And, but they're just kind of tucked away out of view. So let me know if that's what you wanted to see, Alex, uh, if that makes sense, or if I misunderstood. All right, so we see Sir Robert from Atlanta. We have Matt, Matthew Elston checking in from London. All right, and we see Pablo's on the live stream. It's great to have from Galicia, Espana. All right, we see David Griffiths from Wales in the UK. All right, and Jazz Dude. It's on the live stream, and we have Soren in Sweden. All right, and we have Thermonuclear War from Serbia. All right, and we have Jan from Stockholm. Okay. All right, and we have Bob from Macon, Georgia. All right, and we have Glenn from Suffolk, Virginia, so a fellow Virginian. Great to have you on the live stream, Glenn. All right, we have Robbie Bowling from Dallas, and we have Mandy Lane, Trance 202020, and Jeff Sabelski. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and raise my voice up a little bit in the monitor here, so let me know if that's better. Okay, so we just see, is there a new version of Cubase? So currently we're still on 11.041 as the current version, so. Okay, so we see a question from Lewis. Uh, Hi Greg, hope you're well, I'm doing great, thanks for asking. Uh, I'm having an issue with Cubase 11 Pro when I record MIDI on keys and it automatically records a double note a fraction of a second. After each note, any ideas? So, you know, check your MIDI controller. So, you know, a lot of times that could happen when MIDI controllers are transmitting uh, two notes, like if it's in a layer. So let's say if you had something like a Yamaha montage and that particular patch that you're using has it's like maybe a piano and strings layered on top of it. Uh, so the currently active patch may transmit to two different MIDI channels. Um, and if that's the case, it may be transmitting every time you hit one single note, it may be transmitting two notes for each of the MIDI channels. So one way to test this is if you actually just kind of come over, let's add an instrument track. So let's say as we do this, you can just, you know, one is if you hit uh, Alt or Option, I think plus K, you can see if you get the same results when you use the onboard keyboard and you could use the computer keyboard to actually just kind of play, um, to play the MIDI notes right there. Now, what else you could do is come over here and go to the MIDI inserts and at this point, if we go to MIDI monitor, you may notice that for every key that you hit, 
that you may be getting, like, you know, if you hit just a single uh, note message that you may be transmitting on, you'll, you may see on two different MIDI channels here being transmitted. And that would be indicative that it's the MIDI controller is transmitting two uh, notes simultaneously for every note that you're hitting. Some people just go to like, you know, a voice on their keyboard that's just a single voice. It's not layered or like in a performance or a combi mode where it's just, you know, playing on one particular MIDI channel. So I think if you do that, uh, you'll be able to kind of find the culprit there. And we see John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us, John. And remember, uh, just next on Friday's live stream, we will have kind of a shorter live stream and be doing the Cubase uh, Zoom, the Club Cubase Zoom meetup starting at about two hours into the live stream. So, and if you need, if I'll post the uh, Zoom info on the um, on the next live stream, but if you wanna email me, I'd be happy to share that with you guys as well. Okay, so we see, uh, hey Greg, since installing uh, Cubase Pro 11.041 update, Cubase always crashes. I can't go back to 11 with no update. Uh, Cubase 10.5, have 21 gigabyte Cubase 11, 500 uh, and 58 megabytes. Uh, why is that? Um, um, thanks in advance, Greg. So if it's always crashing, the one thing I would do is perhaps start the program and you know, this is the first thing I would do is let's say if I go to um, Nuendo here, we can show you kind of the same idea. So hold down Alt Control Shift or Command Option Shift. So when I come here, just right after starting the program, and this will take you into a diagnostic mode. So try just using, uh, try just setting this to use current, uh, to disable the program preferences. And at that point, that will just kind of disable all of the uh, preferences. So often that could cause something uh, to misbehave. So I would try that and see if maybe it's a third party plugin, but that should kind of make a difference. And sorry, I have a new OS. So Nuendo 10 hasn't been started on this. So hence the messages but um so i would try that and the reason that we see uh cubase 10.5 has 21 gigabytes and cubase 11 is 558 megabytes is that the installers have been broken down into the individual components so we had lots of people that were uh using uh like slower internet connections and didn't want to download a single contiguous 21 gigabyte file for all of the sounds and instruments and uh, loop content so when you go to um like the steinberg download assistant each of those components can be downloaded independently so that's why you see kind of the difference in file sizes so you could download different components at different times and not all at once. All right, so we have a question from Desmond. Uh, how can I move files from C drive to external drives? Cubase seems to uh, default all of my downloads straight to C drive. I'm on Windows 10. So if you're doing this from the download assistant, we'll just kind of come over here. Let me open this. And you could choose the default location. So, so let's say if I wanted to come here, you'll see kind of the target folder indicated here. So if you click here in these three dots, you could change that target folder to anywhere on your computer system and you could download all the content, et cetera, to, uh, to your not to your C drive. All right, so we see Alan Johnson. Al Johnson, great to see you from uh, 
I, I miss seeing him at the NAM show in California the last couple of years, but it's great that you could uh, join us for our live stream. You know, we see Taylor from Pine Grove and Agent K is on. Okay, so we see a question from Glenn. Uh, how do I take a vocal out of a song using spectra layers in Cubase 11 Pro? So really all you have to do, it's pretty straightforward. Let's come over here. I think I have a demo file here that we could show that's YouTube friendly. Okay, so let's say if I have just a, my audio file here. So this will kind of work in conjunction with uh, Spectral Layers 1, which is a part of the Cubase license. So you could download that, um, you know, free of charge from the Steinberg Download Assistant under the Cubase 11 section. So if I wanted to do it, what I'm gonna do is to select the file, we'll go to the audio menu and go to extensions, and then we could see Spectral Layers. So this will launch Spectral Layers. Uh, at this point, you could go to process or under layer, I'm sorry, and you'll see, uh, and if you have, I have kind of the full version installed, but you could also just see the, uh, you'll see kind of unmixed stems, I believe, and then you'll just, at this point, uh, you know, so if I wanted to just unmix the P the vocals from the source, so if you have those like Spectral Layers Pro, we could edit out and extract more information, but Spectral Layers 1 that comes with Cubase 11 Pro, uh, we could extract the vocals from the song. So now we'll just come over here, we'll be unmixing the stems. So we had just the two track recording and what we want to do is take this, um, and we can see that we'll have our two different layers. So we could say uh, on the right hand side here. So if I wanted to take the vocals and let's say as we're playing, so I could say, let's go ahead and just mute the vocals. Or if I wanted to solo the vocal layer, And then you could even drag from the uh, project over and then you could just have the vocals and this will take your, uh, so if we listen to. And now we'll hear both the vocals. The vocals will be isolated on its own track. you feel the urge to see me, well you best pretend you're blind. Now both of them together. So it's I often describe it as kind of like taking the eggs out of the cake after it's been baked in the oven and mixed with all the ingredients. So it's pretty pretty incredible functionality. All right, so we have uh, Matt Elder checking in from Canada. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have a question uh, from Taylor. <clears throat> um, just says, uh, in score editor, lyric defaults to 24 point bold. When I change it, next entry reverts back to 24 point bold. Uh, what have I done to cause this? So let's go ahead and go to a project where you could just kind of. Just look for one. Okay, we'll try this one. Okay, 
Okay, so let's say if I <clears throat> wanted to come here, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll clear my throat, sorry about that. And we'll go to other and let's go ahead and just kind of put lyrics in here. So let's say, I'll put it where it's a little more easier to see, sorry about that. Okay, and let's see if we so here it's defaulting to 10 but let's see if I change these settings here So as I just kind of paint these in, so it looks, so I'm not sure if you're defining it, Taylor, from like once we have the lyrics um, select it <clears throat> and we go to the right zone. So it seems like, you know, I'm not sure if it's maybe <clears throat> if your default system font is set to something else and this might be slightly different on Mac or PC, but you know, when I come here, it's just going to kind of uh, default, you know, it'll be kind of whatever I actually enter in here. So see if you're entering in the font size, maybe from the right zone, if that does the trick for you, but it looks like, you know, and also check to see, um, you know, if that's where you're actually doing it from right there, so. All right, so, but I think that that should do. So let me know if, if you're changing it right there. Okay, and uh, second part of this question. <clears throat> Okay, uh, when I highlight a line of lyrics and change the font, uh, first entry fills and replaces all entries on that line. Is this related to part one? All right, so let's say if I select, um, just gonna slide over here just a little bit. So let's say if I select, um, the lyrics here. So it seems like that's kind of changing them all accordingly without erasing them. So. So it says the first entry fills and replaces all entries on that line. Um, so let me know if that's behaving kind of differently for you, Taylor, than it is for me, and if you're doing it from this particular area. Okay, so I see just, I think from the first question of the live stream that Alex had asked, uh, it says, no, my question is after do, uh, do what you, where can I put the old record of this uh, on a other folder? So, you know, if we we're going back to, let's say our comping, I'll just revert this quickly. So let's say we go back to our comping project.
Okay, um, let's see if I can understand this a little better. So, um, where I can, okay, so it says my question is after do what you, um, where I can put the old uh, recorded this on other folder. Um, so if you want it to, you know, take, you know, if you wanted to get rid of, if you wanted to move the unused files to another folder, um, guess what you could do is I'll activate this, activate this project. So let's say if I, um, I'll just revert from the start here. Okay, so if we have this, um, so let's see if we duplicate this folder or duplicate the particular track. Okay, and I'll open this up and let's see if I So one thing, if you wanted to take the lanes, you could come over here and if you select the lanes, um, we could just come right over here, right click and say, create tracks from lanes. And then if you wanted to move all of these to a new folder, you know, at this point, if you wanted to get rid of the other, so I'm not sure if it's the unused stuff you want to be backed up to a folder or everything. But if we come over here, we could say, um, you know, export audio mix down. And say that we're just going to take just the uh, multiple and we're going to take only the selected uh, folders. And then we could put those into a new, a new folder. So, but if you could let me know, like if, you know, maybe express the question maybe in a different way. Um, so, you know, here we could just kind of take those selections. So you could right click if it's in lanes uh, and then take those into tracks and then migrate those. Or if you just want to take like the unused parts, um, and do that as well. So, um, but let, let me know, if, you know, if it's, you just wanted to keep everything or just uh, specifically exclude what has been used, so. Okay, so we see uh, from Joe K, thanks for being on the live stream. Um, when reamping guitar with a guitar DI out of Cubase, what level should the DI be at when it leaves Cubase? If I send out at the same level it was recorded, the signal doesn't seem hot enough. So a lot of times, you know, when you're doing that, you know, so realize that when you're doing guitar amps, um, so let's say, okay, so it's taking with a guitar DI out of Cubase. What so you know, I would. Realize that sometimes, you know, when you're, if you're feeding it into an actual amplifier, you may have to kind of adjust the level pretty significantly. You know, you may have to adjust the level up or down depending on the impedance because sometimes, you know, the guitar amp impedance is going to be much different than kind of a line level impedance. So if you're saying um, the signal doesn't seem hot enough, you know, it, it, so it could be, so a lot of times there's kind of impedance, uh, you know, matchers that could do that. But you also, if you go to the pre-section, 
Um, you know, so depending on where you're sending it to, you know, or it's like, you know, an old vintage amp or a high gain amp, or maybe something that's like a hardware box, you could add an additional, uh, you know, 48 dB of gain from the pre section of the track right there. And that should be enough gain to kind of get you almost anywhere you want. So if you just go to the channel settings, Joe, and you could just see the gain, and then you could just adjust that gain if you need, if you need the signal to be hotter. But realize sometimes if you're going straight out of an audio interface at line level into a guitar amp, that that could be kind of a different level of signal than just coming out of the guitar directly. So just be just be aware of that but you could probably compensate very easily using the gain from the pre section of the channel EQ all right so we have Miguel checking in from Manila thanks for joining us all right so we have Paul from Stratford upon Avon And we see Mark Rabin from Montana on. All right, so we see a um, question, how to put the Cubase mixer on a separate screen, et cetera, unlock the Cubase mixer from the program. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a solution to resolve it. So generally it's always gonna be just, um, let me just change my, so if you just hit F3, that will place the Cubase mixer into a separate window. So if you don't want it in the lower zone, you can see these three icons at the top and we could just deactivate the lower zone. And anytime that you hit F3, that will take it to a full size mixer. And if you have multiple monitors, you could just drag this over to your second monitor and then just hit F3 by default. We'll always take you and close you out of the full screen mixer. So the function key three, F3. So try that. Okay, so we're just seeing uh, kind of more follow-up from Alex uh, about the comping. So basically when I unfold the track, it's a lot of line. I want to archive the old recordings on the line so it does not occupy the whole window. So, you know, one of the things that you could do also kind of when comping, um, you know, so if you don't want it uh, to occupy kind of the whole window, you know, once you you know, come over here, let's say, okay, you know, to the comp. So let me, I'll revert this again quickly. So one other little editing thing that you could do, and this doesn't necessarily throw away the files, but if you go to editing, Something to be aware of is you can, if you don't want to see the leftover bits is just come and just come over here and enable under editing preferences, just turn enable delete overlaps. And now as soon as we do like, you know, comping stuff that, you know, um, as we want to do different edits and we could do this also from within advanced so you know as we uh, would move different files and let me see if that preference is activated again okay so if you you know weren't kind of comping stuff you know with the comping tool but you know this way you could just say you know as we want to do edits that all the other parts you know, will go away. So, and then again, you could just 
kind of see the different parts of as we do overlaps at the other events will uh, disappear. But you know, Okay, so uh, so I just see a question. Uh, why does MIDI track lose mapping to instrument track? Um, mainly Cine piano. Um, so yeah, I haven't had any problems kind of losing of you know MIDI communication. So you know, as soon as I come over here, but I don't have Cine piano. Um, so, so I'm not sure if it's a MIDI track. So maybe Paul, if you could indicate if it's uh, like a MIDI track and this MIDI track is being routed to, um, so let's say if I come over here and I add an instrument track. So let's say in the rack and I wanted this to be going to pad shop and we're going to create a MIDI track that's going to be routed to, um, so it's not to an instrument track, but it's to a VST instrument, you know, that now as I come over here, um, So I'm not sure, you know, check to make sure that like the track isn't one disabled, make sure that it's enabled. But as we do that, it'll just kind of come right back, make sure that it is kind of, you know, record enabled or monitored so that you hear the sound. But it seems, so I don't have Cine Piano, so I'm not sure if that instrument is losing or the library is, um, is you know or the or you know the the instrumental library is doing anything but you know check uh, you know make sure that everything is kind of set to uh you know as you expected and see if you see midi communication going here you could also check to see you know if you see midi communication going here in the transport bar if you see it reflected perhaps in the instrument a lot of instruments will have like a little keyboard so that you could indicate exactly when it's receiving MIDI, but that, that information would uh, let us know. And if you say you're losing mapping, you know, so, and also if you get the same results, if it's an instrument track versus a MIDI track, so. So we see from uh, Jeff Sabelski, it says, uh, hi Greg, that was a perfect comp demo you just did. I was doing that innuendo last couple of days, zero crossing on all the time, but still hearing clicks, uh, but not all, it's a uh, guitar rhythm. So yeah, the comping works very well. All right. Okay, so we see uh, my expression pedal spits out controller uh, number seven and the MIDI expression controller is 11. Uh, how can I get them to match? So, you know, if, you know, it's really, it could be up to your MIDI controller, might be kind of remapping that. Um, so one is just come over here, go to the MIDI inserts. And if we wanted to uh, go to the MIDI monitor, you could just make sure that, you know, what actual data uh, is being transmitted. So if I come here, you know, we could move various, you know, controllers. So I could say, okay, as I move this, you know, so, um, so let's say, you know, if you're doing that, that's what Cubase is seeing from the hardware. So let's say, you know, if I wanted this knob is controller 33 and I wanted this controller, you know, so let's say if it was um, spitting out controller seven, so, and this is probably defined in your MIDI controller, but what you could do if you want it, you know, if you can't figure out how to change it in your MIDI controller is if you go to the input transformer and we can make this global 
And then once you do this, just come over here first off and make sure that we have this mo uh, module activated and we could take every MIDI seven message from your pedal. And then what we could do is transform it. And what we want to do is to say, we're gonna take type is equal to controller. And then we'll say value one, we want to add, and we'll choose our value of four. So now, and then make sure that this is active. So now as we come over here, this will now spit out controller 37. If when I turn it off, we're back to controller 33. But you know, most of the time, you know, it could be if you have a controller, like a MIDI keyboard controller, it may be just connected. You may have to just reassign what MIDI message is coming in from that foot switch. And if you can't figure it out, you know, take the uh, input transformer approach and that will work. But you know, Cubase is just capturing what it's what is being sent from the MIDI device. Okay, so we see a question from Matt. Uh, how do I uh, get move my my bud channels to the right side of the mixer? Um, so if you wanted to anchor different tracks to the mix console, we could do this in kind of the same way. So let's say I always want to see like uh, my master output here fixed on the right hand side, regardless of what track I'm in here. So to do that, what we could do is we go to the visibility and then we'll see zones. So there's three zones in the mixer. So whatever channel that you want to see. So if I always want, you know, this particular channel, like my stereo output, so I'll come here and have my input outputs. And then instead of this being in kind of the one generic zone, I could say, I want that to always be fixed on the right, regardless of where I am here. And let's say I want it audio 10 to always be fixed on the left hand side. So this way we could kind of just split the mix console into different zones, kind of a left zone, our channels and a right zone, a center zone for the channels. So this way, you know, it used to be a lot of consoles and you may have an input section and then you may have like the outs, you know, fixed on the right hand side. So you could do something very similar. So, and once you're in kind of the full screen mixer, you know, again, you would just come over here, go to visibility and just go to zones and then you could set, and those could be independent. Uh, so you have different settings in the lower zone mixer and different settings for each of the other mix consoles as well. All right, so we see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. Thanks for joining us. And we have Bob from Tarpon Springs, Florida. and Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. So I think the virtual ice cream will begin. And Pablo is very happy to see Michael on, all right. And John has been granted six scoops. I think that might be a record of blackberries and cream ice cream. Michael always has the best, uh, the best ice cream flavors. All right, and we have Christian checking in from Oberhausen, Germany. Thanks for joining, being a part of the live stream. All 
All right, so we see uh, Greg uh, and Cubase can work with sound design of games, films, or is it better to use Nuendo for this? Nuendo will have a couple of particular plugins. I think that you'll find kind of the editing to be pretty similar between them. There, there is uh, like a voice designer plugin which can make robotic sounds, um, you know, inside of uh, you know, as it's just a plugin. So if that's something that you that you want to do, or you're doing, you know, robot voices, you know, Nuendo could be a great solution for that. Uh, there will be a Doppler plugin, which is, you know, really good for sound design and kind of post work that's also kind of unique to Nuendo. But, you know, most of the other functionality and, you know, you can do a tremendous amount of sound design just kind of, you know, doing, you know, using pad shop, which is in both. So, you know, we have lots of people that are doing sound design solely in Cubase for filming games without any problems. So, but, you know, I would say for the Doppler uh, and for if you're doing, you know, Doppler and if you need to kind of do synthetic voices, that the voice designer plugins, uh, those are really good and kind of unique and only in Nuendo. So. All right, so we see from uh, Shane just saying, I so wish I was more knowledgeable with Cubase. I've gone from Cubase AI to 11 Pro, and it's a constant learning curve at the moment. I uh, look forward to these Cubase streams. Appreciate all you do, Greg. So, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, just figure out how you're going to do, you know, you know, figure out a task and how you want to accomplish that. And, you know, as you do it, you know, try to teach yourself one keyboard shortcut a day. And if you could do a keyboard shortcut as opposed to going to the menus, you know, that type of stuff can make uh, your workflow much faster, you know, and realize that, you know, Cubase can do so much that, but you don't have to utilize every feature of the program. So don't be overwhelmed to just say, you know, today I'm going to work on drums. Today I'm going to work on tuning a vocal and kind of figure out that task, you know, organically as you see, as you see the needs word. So you don't have to, you know, the only person that probably is really whose job relies on them knowing everything about Cubase is my job. Um, so, but, you know, just have, you know, figure out how Cubase needs to work for you. And then you should be, you know, um, at that point you should, you know, be able to kind of get it under control. So. Okay, so Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. Okay, so we see uh, it's just Jariath Quinn just saying, took the plunge, upgraded to Cubase Pro 11 from 8.5, only uh, 136 pounds. So it's a pretty good deal. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to set the loop range to be exactly a set length? The problem is when I click and drag uh, the BPM, the loop range will move. Uh, maybe punch in and punch out points, any ideas? All right, so let's say if we have, um, Okay, so let's say if I'm using my range tool here, and I'm just gonna reread this one more time, just to make sure. Um, so, and then you could see the range length here. So let's say if I just see my range length. So if I say, okay, I want this loop range length to be seven seconds, you know, I could just kind of adjust it here from the info line. So if I would say, okay, now I want this to be exactly, you know, 4.123 seconds. So you will see the range length option right there in the timeline. So let me know if that'll work for you. 
Uh, but any range that you have selected, just you'll see the range length and you could adjust directly here to very specific values or if you wanted to just use the left and right mouse button for the you know, start time, for the ending time and you could adjust this you know, accordingly and say, okay, I just need this to be exactly four seconds for my range selection. So that's how you could adjust the range length. Let me know if that works for you. Okay, so I just see uh, from Taylor Sapp, going back to the score question. Um, this is from an earlier version of Cubase. Uh, I was selecting font by double clicking to the left on the first bar. The right zone looks different and doesn't have the uh, same option. So it, if you have version 11, that was the right zone, I think was introduced in version 11. But I think the older way will still work. So let's take a look. But if you have 11, that may be a good way, Taylor, to kind of look at it. So let me switch this to page mode. I'll just zoom in a bit. And let me see if I come over here to the font sizes, I think it might be. And let me just see where, it, I think Taylor may have indicated where. So let's say we go to our font settings here. Um, I think it's really kind of the same settings. So let's say I go from 10 to 14. I'll just make it. And let's say if I select fonts like this, if you're just going from So it doesn't seem like it's changing so much there, but if you have, uh, let me know if you have, I, I can't remember Taylor, if you have version 11, um, but version 11 had kind of added this right zone so that you could um, make adjustments there. But let's see also if, So there we could change kind of the, for, let's see if the lyrics are in here. Let's 
So I can see where it doesn't seem like it's changing, but see if you do have 11, let me know and then see if that works. Okay, reading through uh, different comments and finding my place real quick. All right, and we have uh, Benny checking in from Sweden and JVI also checking in. Great to have you on the live stream. All right, so Michael Teams has granted me three scoops of coconut cream pie ice cream, so I feel lucky. Okay, uh, so just see from uh, Shane. Hi, Greg, uh, quick question. How do I get the master live meter on the right side of my screen like you have it? Um, so if you are just kind of playing, you could come over here and Make sure that you have the right zone activated. And then you could just see meter here is one of the options. And you could select which meter scale you want to use. So once again, just Come right over here, make sure that the right zone is active, and then you'll see like VSTI, media, control room, or meter. And if you wanted to, you could also uh, go to the control room and, you know, within the control room, see kind of a combination of the metering as well. Uh, just so, but just click right there, and then you could have the metering directly on the right hand side fixed. All right, so we see from uh, Paul Hardy just saying MIDI route it to. So I assume that's with our question of going back to the Cine Piano Library. Um, so yeah, just, it seems like, you know, let me know if that's, uh, like comes in like a, as a contact library or if it's using a different player, but it seems like it's, uh, like I really haven't run into that problem and also try just the virtual keyboard, which is alter option plus K and see if you have communication there with it. Okay, so we have a question uh, with regards to comping. Uh, after I record a take with five lanes, I want to hear all five individually several times. Before I comp, I keep unmuting entire lanes. Is there a better way? So if you wanted to listen to like a number of, you know, of the different takes in the comp, without having to mute and unmute, that's where, so let's say if we have our lane here, all you have to do is just grab the hand tool and instead of having to mute and unmute, once you uh, go to, once you click on a different lane, that will mute, that will enable that track to be played and that will mute all of the other tracks for you. So you don't have to kind of constantly solo, unsolo, mute and unmute parts manually. So just using just the comp tool you say okay we're only listening to this take and if you want to just listen to each take a couple times and figure out what parts you like of each one so you can say oh, i really like the ending of that you could just kind of cut and say okay now i like this little middle part right here so i don't have to do any cutting and this will also follow the grid and we could turn that off so at this point you know we could 
just say I only want these particular lanes and then you could click just on those particular sections to try out different areas to make sure transitions work so uh, so this way you don't have to you could manually mute and unmute uh, but that could get very tedious so this one comp tool will kind of you know whatever you select will be unmuted and if there's something there before um, that will then you know once something is unmuted it mutes everything else in that particular time All right, so we see a uh, question. My Cubase 11 keeps crashing every time I close it. How do I figure out which plugin crashes it? So uh, when I have so many plugins, you know, I think that, you know, you may sometimes when you get the little like startup message, sometimes a plugin may um, give you like a, it may give you an error message saying this plugin caused at the very top, you know, this, this plugin caused, uh, you know, the program to crash last time. Uh, but sometimes you may just have to isolate it into groups of plugins. So, you know, try a project, you know, and just load up, you know, look at the plugins that are in that particular project and, you know, you may have to try like five at a time. Um, so, and just kind of whittle it down. So. And usually it doesn't take so long to do, you know, I have people with like, you know, 3000 track templates and, you know, they could usually kind of do five or 10 at a time and find the culprit pretty quickly. Okay, uh, we just see, hi, uh, for what purpose is audio file bounce selection or bounce MIDI? So. You know, if I had, um, let's say if I come here, all right, so let's say at this point I have, you know, my audio file here and I've done, you know, a bunch of different edits. So let's say I have this over here. Um, let me just take one particular lane here just to kind of show this a little easier. Okay, so let's say I have one audio file and now I've done like all sorts of very tedious editing and I come here and I've deleted this section. I have moved this section over and I have slipped uh, the audio, the contents within the file, and I want this to do, you know, um, and I have edited out maybe a bunch of breaths or just noise. So let's say this is, you know, and I want this to now be kind of one you know, contiguous audio event that's been edited so that I don't have to group these together to move them. I could just have one single audio file that I need to pass on to the client. That's when we could come over here and just say, okay, I'm gonna go to my audio. And what we could do is just bounce selection. We could replace the events. And now this will be one contiguous audio file that kind of consolidated all of those edits into a new part so this is kind of a separate new newly created audio file that will kind of contain all those edits kind of finalized so that's kind of the intention of that and when we have bounce midi so So let's just copy this a couple times. And I think that we could kind of just take this 
and make that into one part so that we can move one single entity as opposed to multiple entities. All right, so we have Brian from checking in from Crystal Coast, North Carolina. Thanks for joining today. Okay, so we just see uh, from Paul Hardy, just going back to his earlier question, and just says uh, MIDI routed to instrument track uh, occurs after restart. Um, so, you know, let us know if it's, if it happens only with your controller or with the, uh, the virtual controller, which is alter option plus K as well. So if I come here, uh, you could see kind of the on-screen keyboard. So if you let us know, Paul, if that works kind of, uh, you know, if you get the same behavior either way, you know, if it's just at one particular instrument. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Dave from Italy. Uh, please, could you explain the relationship between audio regions, audio clips, and selection range? Okay. All right, so when we come over here, we could say this is gonna be our audio region. Okay, so you know we have like maybe one audio file here, and this could be, a region so often if we want it to come over here and i think clips would often be considered when we go into let's say our sample editor so i will double click here let's say on our sample editor and now we could set up clips so if i come over here we could say let's go to regions and we could define different region so let's say you know we're doing an interview and this is like the really good part of the interview and we give this region a name and then this was um you know a killer improv part that someone played you know they were just kind of we recorded them for you know 32 minutes and you know while they're capturing and conjuring creativity so we could create these as regions now these would often be as clips so when we go to our pool window under media we could see our audio file here and then we see this additional little plus sign and here we could see these particular regions and we could drag and drop just that particular clip of that region so that's how you could do that and if we go back to our pool window uh, if I wanted to turn these into separate distinct audio files, and these are basically audio files that play back from somewhere in the middle and end somewhere in the middle. So like a, a pre, you know, a, it's basically a predefined portion of the, uh, or a predefined clip from the event. So we think of the event as kind of the overall biggest level hierarchy. But if I wanted to then turn these into audio events, or we could think of them as um, you know, basically going into, uh, if I wanted to take these clips, which are just referencing different start and end points at that point, I could bounce selection. Uh, we could choose a folder and then these will now be created as audio files. Now, when we deal with range selection, this would allow me to take a part of the clip and just separate it so that I could just come right over here and say, okay, I just want to take this particular range and deal with that as a separate entity without necessarily having to split. So the event is kind of like the container file. We could think of clips as being defined ranges uh, that we can manipulate later or recall. And then for simplified editing, we could often just use kind of the range tool to move, you know, different portions and you know for different processing so all 
Okay, so we just see, uh, have you covered running Cubase with Darko together? Uh, there are sound problems. Uh, would it be fixed um, by a full Darko version? So, you know, it, de it could depend on your audio interface, but, you know, generally, so let's say if I'm playing here, you know, and I wanted to open up Dorco, um, you know, make sure one that you have the studio set up and that you have the audio system that, you know, you could choose to release the driver when the application is in the background. And now if I just wanted to go to Dorco, Sorry, I just upgraded my operating system last week. I haven't run all the programs yet over the weekend. All right, so let's say if I just wanted to come right over here in Dorco. So both programs kind of playing simultaneously. So, so uh, you know, check to make sure that your audio inter you know, if you're using the same audio interface, um, but you know, I've gone back and forth and not had any problems playing audio from Dorco or Cubase on Mac or PC. All right, great to see Kai Wen Franklin on the live stream. All right, so we have a question. Uh, what is the difference between sends and inserts? Um, so when we have uh, sends and inserts, so we can think of inserts are gonna be dedicated just to that particular channel. So if I wanted to come here uh, to this project, and let's say we're just, playing along. So if I want it to just affect um, one track, I could come over here and say, okay, we'll go to my bass track. And if I go to inserts, so let's say I wanted to add uh, the VST bass amp here. So that's only going to be on that particular track. But let's say if I wanted to have, so often, you know, so that will be dedicated to that one particular track. Now let's say for running a reverb and I wanted multiple tracks to be able to access that reverb. So what I could do now is I could come over here and this is when we would use send. So I could go to, because I wanted to send multiple tracks, let's say to uh, the revelation reverb here. So, so now when I do this, I can say, okay, I wanted to take the kicks and I go to my sends, I can say, okay, we want this going out to revelation. So let's say I'll come over here to my snare So I could turn this on and what Ascend allows us to do is to take different amounts and we have this little slider. 
So if I solo, let's say my snare, we could blend the amount of the actual effect going on. So if I want it to be very dry, and if I want it to blend more of that track. So I could send multiple tracks to this reverb in varying amounts. And this is often, and this control here, this is sending, so this is to send, whereas the insert is only gonna be dedicated to that particular channel. So many people will use sends for reverbs that will be shared across multiple tracks so that it sounds like, you know, you're creating perhaps the illusion that everything is in the same room, the same ambient characteristics, you know, and often a reverb, the same reverb may be used across multiple channels. Um, and that's when people would use sends. Um, some people would, you know, just take a different reverb as inserts. Uh, and put the same effect on multiple inserts and that is only good at really, you know, taking away your CPU processing. So this way I could have 12 tracks go to this reverb and I'm running one instance of that reverb on my CPU. So people do it for CPU reasons, but also just for kind of sonic uh, capabilities so that you could have, you know, like cohesive sounding mix. So. Inserts are dedicated to particular channels. Sends can be shared across multiple tracks and each of those tracks could send different amounts uh, between this between, and as it's to the left, it's dried and we kind of blend in the, the effect. So we're sending to the effects uh, just by adjusting that slider. So it used to be often, you know, some of the terminology evolved from, you know, studios would have a dedicated room like an echo chamber so they would actually send the signal into that room and re-record it. So that's where we kind of get some of the terminology. Okay, so we see uh, from Taylor Sapp uh, says, when I record a VST instrument, there doesn't seem to be any difference if I have track monitoring on or off. Is there a difference I'm not aware of? Not so much with like VST instruments, Taylor, but let's so say if I come here. Um, but the difference is like I could have this track, you know, so let's say if I want it to only monitor and play back incoming MIDI to this instrument, but if I record, I could still hear, but no MIDI will actually be recorded. So we could send, you know, so if I don't want to record, but I just want, like, let's say if I was doing a live thing uh, and I wanted to play the MIDI track, but not necessarily have it record, and I just wanted to play back live, we could use the monitor enable. Uh, and then it's not going to record, but if we, you know, have the record enable on, you know, as we go to record, this information will be recorded. So it allows you to kind of hear virtual instruments without record enabling them. So if you record enable, you're going to hear it. Um, but if you want it to be able to play or perform, without, you know, or just kind of try out ideas without it being recorded, you could just come right over here and monitor the signal. And that's the intention of that. Um, so you just see, I opened Cubase now and the stream stopped working, citing an error. It helped uh, by switching the sound output to the speakers of the notebook, then back. Um, so when we, you know, again, just make sure that, you know, cause a lot of times there's different drivers, you know, what Cubase is gonna be utilizing is, you know, ASIO or core audio drivers, which can minimize latency. But what you want to do is just to make sure that when you do this, so, you know, the operating system could be using different drivers, especially on a Windows platform, but just make sure that you have release uh, driver in, uh, when application is in background and that should 
take care of it for you. And sometimes, you know, your windows uh, with like a windows audio driver, you may have to do it in the windows driver as well, which is always kind of buried and different on every single sound card. But, you know, if you do that setting in Cubase, that will probably get you there where you could kind of go back and forth easily. All right, so we see, uh, what is this? So this is our Club Cubase live stream where we answer people, ask questions on their uh, Cubase, uh, and we try to help them out and people learn about how to utilize the software better for their needs. Okay, reading through comments. Michael Teams wants people to hit the like button. All right, uh, so we see, how, hey Greg, how can I make the mixed console window uh, stays open while I'm editing? It closes anytime I click outside of it. So if it's in, you know, if it's in your lower zone, you know, so, you know, you could do all of your edits here. Um, so let's say. So let's say, you know, so we could do kind of all of your edits here. And I think if you go to like a standalone mixer. So if it's on a separate monitor, you could do that. I don't think that there's an always on top mode when you right click. So if you're kind of working with the uh, monitor here, you know, you may have to reset to windows. And if you wanted to do that and save it as a workspace, you know, you could add that as a workspace, but you know, a lot of people have kind of, you know, if they're doing a lot of editing and need access to mixers, either have the mixer on a separate screen or just use kind of the mixer in the lower zone uh, while you're doing editing. Okay, uh, so we see, uh, is there a shortcut to freeze a track? So I don't think that there is a shortcut to it. Um, so, but what you could do, you know, um, instead of freezing, you could use a shortcut to do uh, render in place. So, you know, so that is kind of, we could think of that as a more contemporary version of freezing tracks. So if you want it to, do that, you could just choose to render in place and use a keyboard shortcut for that. But I don't think that there's a uh, shortcut for freezing. Okay, so you just see a uh, question. I don't understand how to work with the loop mash tool. Uh, it seems interesting to me, but I don't understand how it works. So there's kind of two different versions of loop mash if we want to think of it that way. So one will be a virtual instrument that will take different audio loops that may not fit together, that may you know be rhythmically different rhythmically off um, so and we could kind of put those two uh, together so um, so say if I just wanted to add a loop mash we could kind of start off so if we're doing it as an instrument um, you know I could come over here and you get all sorts of great content with it so let's say I'll just so and we could have this kind of automatically sync to the project tempo. So let's say it should be set up very similar to kind of like a keyboard. So, you know, we could now just trigger different scenes from this that we want. So let's say in. And I'll just try it maybe different. So let's say as we're working with this, we could have different scenes.
Now, kind of the intention of Blue Mash is that we could have kind of like almost like a master audio file. So let's say, you know, if we do this, um, we could bring in different files and, you know, this will go through what they call perceptual indicators. So let's say I have this file. And when you see the red light here, this indicates that it is kind of the master file. Now I could bring in other loops. And even though these loops are different tempos, they could kind of automatically lock into the feel. So if I wanted to make this the master, now this loop could be following this particular, and we could bring in So loops that don't naturally kind of fit together can now just kind of be brought in and these could be triggered from different from different MIDI notes. So we could play it kind of like a sample masher and just trigger these in real time from MIDI. Now there's a performance section which also shows up as a plugin. So if we go to um, let's say our master bus here, and I wanted to do kind of performance effects, uh, like tape stops and stuff like that, you'll find the loop mash FX right here. So, so let's say as I play this, let's say I play back like this little rock track um, that while it's playing, I could do different like stutters. So say as I'm here, I can say, okay, let's just take this and you know, and you could change kind of the rhythmic pulse. I say I want to do almost like DJ type of effects. And you could play this in real time. Or just kind of capture a little phrase. So, and then all you'd have to do is once you have a loop mash FX, if you add a MIDI track, you could then just play that in real time. Just, you'll see the loop mash FX show up as a MIDI port. Uh, and then you could just play this from MIDI in real time. So in, there's kind of two versions of loop mash. So you'll have kind of the sample uh, slicer manipulator and the uh, performance effects as well. All right, so you see that thermonuclear war doesn't have ice cream. So he appears to be sad. Okay, so we just see a question. Um, um, how to generate harmony in Cubase? All right, so let's take a look. Um, So what I'm gonna do is figure out kind of a, a chord track to start with. So let's say I'm gonna look at my piano part here. So let's listen to it. Again, if I wanted to see it in my score editor. So now what I want to do is I'll just select I'm going to select the piano part and go to my project menu to chord track. And I'm going to say create chord symbols. All right. And this will tell us kind of basically what chords the piano was playing. I'm going to go into 
um, we'll listen here. So let's say I want to, just on that last phrase, I'm gonna select it. Um, and since we know kind of what the chords are already from the piano, I could go to audio. And at this point we could say generate harmony vocals or generate harmony voices. And we could do up to uh, four harmonies and I'll hit okay. And we'll just do two in this case. And now I'll bring these down slightly in volume. And that's really kind of all you had to do. And you could switch the voices if you want to do tenor and bass or soprano and alto. So, Okay, so we have, uh, can you please show how to set up a key command that reverts an audio event back to its original state with one key command? I saw Ian Kirkpatrick do it in a stream, I believe. All right, so let's say if I come here... Uh, and I've done all sorts of processing on audio, such as, um, so let's say if I come here and I do a fade in on that, I wanted to process a plugin. So let's say, okay, let's put an octaver on it and um, let's remove the DC offset. I wanted to put a coursing on it or flanger, so, all right. So now when we come over here, um, let me see if this is set up from a keyboard shortcut. Um, but I think that, let's take a look. If, if it's not, I could reach out to Ian and see what he's doing. Or if you had the live stream, I could check it out, but let's take a look, see if, So it might be under direct offline processing. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to, so you, if you have the particular stream, but I think if you come over here, we could just, uh, if you right click, you could just delete all. And let me just see if that's, in the keyboard shortcuts and he may be doing it through a macro um He might be just doing kind of a revert. But I think that's just going to be there. So he could be, I'm not sure if it's through a keyboard shortcut, but if I've done a number of processing, I could just say delete all. And you could go right back to the original. Uh, and he may also be working with uh, track versions. So if he wanted to come here, so let's say if you've done a number of edits, so let's say if you just um, come here, so let's say you duplicate this track version and at this point, you know, you do um, all sorts of horrific edits. You know, he may be just coming over here and you could do this with a keyboard shortcut and just um, go back to the original track version. So those are 
two methods, but if he's doing something else, I could let me know and I could you could send me an email to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de and I could reach out to Ian. Okay, um, so we just see a uh, question. Is there a way to have the right zone display any track from the mix console, like maybe an input track for the microphone? So yeah, you could do that. Um, so let's say if you have, you know, input channels in the mixer. Um, so a lot of times, you know, just old school methodology, but if we come over here to the visibility again, um, you know, we could see, um, you know, our input output channels, but you know, if we have this set up, um, you know, we could, you know, once we have, you know, your, um, let's just say, so usually the input channels will be kind of fixed to the right. Let me see if I could do it in the, may have to have the actual input routed to somewhere. Let me just. Check my audio connections very quickly. But a lot of times the input channels will be kind of fixed to the left hand side here. Uh, but let's see if we can select these, if we could get them in the. So it's usually the outputs, but. Um, so, you know, but the actual channel itself, so let's say, you know, here's where the vocal is. I could take that and just kind of go to the visibility, to the zones and say, okay, you know, this is the track I'm recording now or have that anchored to the right in my stereo out, you know, so this way, you know, the track I'm recording, I could have anchored just to the left. And like a lot of times people put buses, groups, effects, and uh, master bus to the right. So, all right. So we see, uh, if I have an audio track, um, I'm just, sorry, it just kind of jumped on me. So you have lots of questions coming in my future. Okay, um, so just see question, sorry, I just found it. Uh, if I have an audio track that has too high of an input signal, can it be fixed without recording again? Um, it, it could be hard to do. So I think if you have spectral layers, um, so let's say if I want it to come here um, and let's go to my audio and let's say if I go to, uh, I don't think I have an audio file to kind of show it on, but let's say if we go to spectral layers and we launched at one of uh, the you know functions that you could have in spectral layers is a clip repair. You know, I've sometimes heard you know the analogy of you know it's kind of like you know undoing burnt steak. You know that once it's kind of been cooked, it could be tricky. But you know that would probably be like one of the best things to do. So you know always be careful. <clears throat> when recording to make sure that, you know, it's always easier to add gain, especially digitally than it is to, uh, you know, take something that was too hot to actually, 
um, you know, that was too hot and is, you know, going to be problematic. So. All right, so we see Cedric is on the live stream from India. Thanks for joining. All right, so we just see uh, Taylor just mentioning uh, um, uh, about the scoring issues says uh, using 11.02 to view older project uh, my right zone 11 is different than yours did they change it with the later update so it should be the same in 11 so let's say if we look at the score editor but just make sure that you know you have this in the upper right hand corner up here you'll see the little icons so you could say okay i want it you know like my left icon but you know go to the right icon here uh but if you have version 11 you know from 11.00 that was the uh actual function directly there was that capability was there but it may not be on by default so make sure that you just turn that on right there taylor All right, so we see from uh, Making Music Online, thanks for doing these live streams, uh, very interesting and informative, uh, and yay, Alexandria, Virginia. I used to live near Landmark, so yeah, it's not far from me at all. If you watched uh, any of the Wonder Woman 1984, Wonder Woman 84, the mall that they used, that was all Landmark Mall, so if, you're, if you saw that film, it looked familiar. So it's kind of closed now, being redone as a shelter. Okay, so we see from uh, JVI says, uh, entire lane listening. Thanks, Greg. I uh, feel a bit silly now. Thanks so much. Uh, Going to save me a lot of time. Yeah, so that's a, just a, a great kind of purpose built tool for that. All right, wonderful to see Sable Winters on the live stream. All right, so I just see, um, you know, Greg, I have a project where the CPU is bouncing between 50 to 100% without the project even playing. What is causing this? So a lot of times, you know, when you work with plugins, uh, especially VST2 plugins, you know, those plugins are taking processing power, you know, when, it, you know, regardless of it, whether the, you know, track is playing or not. So you could just, you know, uh, so, you know, some plugins, so if you're running VST three plugins, you know, you could see if you come over here to your preferences and go to VST, um, there is a, um, let's find the preference. So I think under plugins, we could choose. Um, suspend VST3 plugin processing when the audio is received. But if your project um, has a lot of really heavy plugins, you know, a lot of plugins will take that processing power. Once that plugin is loaded, whether it's playing or not, it will still take a lot of CPU power. But if it's, you know, so whether regardless of if it's playing or not. Now with this option, your VST3 plugins 
will not take any CPU power until it's actually passing and processing through audio. So, you know, it's just kind of how the plugin architecture works. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not, you know, it's pretty typical. Okay, so we just see uh, from Jeff Sabelski, uh, Greg, when you comped with the tool, your snap to zero wasn't on. Uh, mine in Nuendo uh, was on, but I still heard some clicks, uh, but not on all of them, and I couldn't find out why. Uh, even fades didn't work well. Yeah, so generally, you know, I haven't really had much problems with comping, you know, and one of the things that you could do, um, Jeff, is if you go to the inspector, you know, and let's say I go to, like I have an audio track selected, you know, you could do just like the auto fades. So at this point, you know, anytime that the audio would, you know, start to play back or, you know, goes from clip to clip to clip, you know, for that particular track that you could just, uh, you know, have the auto fades turned on and off and that could save you a lot of editing and you could access this again, just from the inspector here and just activate the auto fades for that particular track. And you can say, okay, I just want the auto fade in fade out or auto cross fades. And that will just add a short fade in fade out as the audio is playing back. It's not actually written into the file. It's just on playback. But if you're just doing editing and you don't want to hear the clicks, try that. All right, wonderful that Dan Freeman could make the live stream. Okay, so we have a question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, is it possible to make a macro triggering multiple commands? For example, can I use a macro to add multiple audio tracks to a project uh, and be able to choose mono and stereo? So you, a macro can do that, but not, uh, at, you know, and what a macro is going to do is to just kind of trigger key commands. So, you know, I could come over here and um, so if I wanted to add 10 audio tracks, I could come over here and say, let's do new macro. Okay, so now what I could do is just come over here and we will choose, I want to add audio mono or audio stereo. So I could say, let's add 10 audio uh, mono tracks. So I could now come here and I'm gonna select a macro. This is my function. I'm just gonna add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So as soon as I trigger that macro, I will just come over here and go to the macros and we'll say, uh, add 10 audio tracks. And they're done just like that. So um, at that point, that's, you know, I had some audio tracks in there before, but that's really kind of all you'd have to do. Um, and then, you know, you could, I think you could choose to just, you know, if you have the other one, we'll default to stereo. So you have the choice in the macro where you could, you know, make it do, um, you know, stereo or mono tracks. So just come over here to add tracks. So yep, you could do that. Okay, so we see uh, whenever I have an event selected and I press spacebar stop, it jumps to the playhead to the front of that event. How do I disable that? Okay, so let's come over here. All 
All right, so let's say if I'm here and I press the space bar and it jumps, so it's probably gonna be, um, if you go to the transport menu, you'll see use video follows edit mode. So now anytime that you select an event, it will just go to the selected event. So try just to go to transport and uncheck use video follows edit mode. And then uh, when you hit stop, it'll kind of stay at the same position. All right, so you see Michael Pierce joining us and you did miss the giveaway today, so he was asking, so. It was so good that we, we all decided not to talk about what the giveaway was, so. But glad you could join us and hope to see you on Friday for the Zoom meetup. Okay, reading through comments and ice cream flavors. Okay, uh, so we just, um, all right, you see a question from Jeff Sabelski. Uh, Greg, I wrote a jazz type solo nuendo at 64 BPM. The score is perfect, but I used uh, but when I use 30 second of phrases, I can edit the quantize to 30 seconds right in the score. So am I missing a simple thing to do? Um, so I think I have an example that may just work with this without having to recreate it. Uh, let me find my Schubert project. I'll just open it up. So to help with this, often we could just do some uh, quick display quantization. So just get this project loaded up. So let's say like in this piece, we have 30 second notes just written kind of at a very slow tempo. So where we kind of see these little, uh, you know, where this should probably be like a 30 second. So I would grab the display quantize tool and you know just kind of maybe select the area and say, okay, the notes here, I want it to be 30 second. And that will kind of go through and probably just, you know, make your 30 second notes into 30 second notes. So right click in the score editor and grab the display quantize tool and then kind of as you click, you know, you could, you'll just kind of get that little uh, window pop up. So we'll undo this, show it one more time. So where you kind of see like, okay, you know, that doesn't quite look right. Grab that and then you could set the display quantize value accordingly and that should help. All right, so we have Lauren Roser checking in from New York City. Thanks for joining the live stream and being a part of the community. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Yol. Um, how can you make the whole 
channel colored in the mixer. So this came in, I think version 10.5. So if we go to our mix console um, and we want to see this colored, so let's say if we hit F3 and we wanted to see kind of the colors through the project. So if we come over here and go to uh, file, we'll go to our preferences under Cubase. So, and I think if we go to um, track and mix console channel colors that you want to colorize mix console channels. So we see this preference right here. So if I hit apply, those will all be kind of a uh, static color, but if I wanted to come here and then apply the color and you could set the intensity of that color. So I think that was in 10.5 and later. So if you wanted to see it more kind of demure, we could do that or to colorize preferences under user interface, track and mix console channel colors, just enable mix console channels right there. All right, so uh, we see from uh, Kush, Diara, um, you just demonstrated sending multiple drum tracks to one reverb. When I do so, I can no longer pan those individual drum tracks hard, uh, hard left or right, even going through the send panning. So let's go ahead and I'll just go back to that project. Okay, so let's say, okay, we have our drum tracks. I'm gonna select my drum tracks, right? And we want to, now at this point, uh, add effects channel to the selected channels. And one is make sure the configuration here is set to stereo in the effect that we're adding. So let's say, okay, I wanted to add, um, and we'll send it to reverence. Okay, so we add our track. Right, so it's a now I will solo my snare. So now, if I just wanted to come here, let's say we'll bypass that so we listen to oh, the snare, we'll come back in here. So that's panned, but now we're going through the stereo effects. So the original source will be. So, but make sure that you're sending it to, um, you know, to a stereo when you go to add the effects channel track that, you know, the effect itself is in stereo in the configuration here. Uh, and also make sure that, you know, its outputs are set to stereo out. Um, you know, because if it's mono, then you may run into what you describe. All right, um, so we see Atlanta Guitars on the live stream. Great to have you back. Um, all right, so we have a question. Is there a way to avoid uh, ISP peaks? Um, I assume this is intersample peaks in mastering uh, as way uh, as way as it possible. Um, you know, so generally if you're working, you know, at really high, you know, if you're working in 32-bit floating point, you know, you generally, you know, as soon as we're doing 
processing and playback of your audio i don't think that you would really have you know since everything is in floating point it, i guess it's theoretically possible but it would be really difficult to actually you know uh clip the audio engine so i don't think it's that much of an issue um maybe with some hardware stuff it you know or other recording systems you know that could be an issue All right, so we just see, uh, is there a way to grab the screen with my mouse to move around the project window? So not in the main project window, but if we come over here and let's say if we have the overview, um, you know, at this point we could just kind of, you know, grab and let me just open something, a project with more tracks to show this a little better. So if I come over here to, so it's not necessarily like where you could, um, you know, move everything kind of here. I've seen some of our programs that do that, but if you go to kind of the overview window, uh, here you could, you know, choose to, you know, navigate kind of, you know, more horizontally than vertically, but, you know, we could just kind of, navigate pretty quickly here as well but i don't think that there's let me see if i could with maybe a modifier key to navigate so but it's really just going to be more kind of sliding the events around as opposed to moving the events but you kind of choose what you see Okay, so just see um, any possibility of covering Nuendo down mixes from Atmos. Um, you know, part of the you know concept of Atmos is that it will you know do all of the down mixing for you, regardless of whatever uh, whatever playback you're on. So you don't necessarily. Um, you know, have to, you know, that then that's kind of the intention of Atmos is that if you have 64 speakers or if you have five speakers or 15 speakers that the down mixing is, you know, or you're just listening in stereo or mono that the down mixes is kind of handled through the, you know, Dolby Atmos, uh, you know, algorithm. So that's kind of why a lot of people, you know, want to migrate it to it that they could feel that they could do an Atmos mix. And at that point, um, you know, have the Atmos mix automatically do the down mixing automatically based on the playback system. So that would just kind of be handled. Now, if you want it to, let's see if this is the file I was thinking of here real quick. Yeah, so, but now, you know, if you wanted to come over here, so let's say, you know, as we're kind of, you know, playing back, you know, you could in the control room, you know, so if you wanted to, at this point, you know, there are different down mix presets. So if you wanted to listen to this in 5.1, mono or stereo, you could just do that through the control room and that will do kind of the down mixing for you. But once again, you know, Dolby Atmos, you know, as it's kind of decoded from the ADM file, you know, will automatically do the down mixes for you for the different formats.
or at least it's supposed to, so. Okay, so I just see, um, the sound does not work for me in a preview of the sample loops on the right preview and, and the preview of the work in the sample editor, how to fix it. So just make sure that you go to your, to your studio menu, to audio connections, and go to the control room and make sure that you activate, you right click and you add a monitor and that you have the monitor set for the, you know, where your converter or your audio interface is going to the, your speakers, your monitoring system. And you wanna have like your outputs here set, but um, defined as like a stereo output, just chosen as not connected, even though that seems counterintuitive at first. But basically what we could do is route that through the control room, because as we audition, you know, different loops and stuff like that, you know, this often will, you know, just as we're, you know, auditioning different loops, you know, this isn't actually assigned to a particular track at this point. So um, that's why it's not routed in through a particular channel. So just activate the control room and do your routing there. And then you'll be able to hear all the previews were there and within the sample editor. Okay, so we see uh, from Atlanta Guitar just saying a uh, basic question. Um, I'm always interested in taking, say, a mono guitar and using a detuning delay to achieve a wide pan sound from mono source. Uh, no big deal if others have questions. Thanks. So, you know, if you want it to do that, you know, so let's say if I come to, let's say we're here, uh, let's take this down to kill. Sorry about that. All right. So let's say I want to take you know this guitar here. And I could duplicate this track. And let's say I'll pan this one differently. Take its automation off, so like that. And let's say this track I wanted to detune just slightly. So I'll just take this and then you could just adjust fine tuning. Let's say in context. I got some cheap wine. Let's have a good time. So you could, you know, do stuff like that, but obviously the plugins, you know, like the built in um, chorusing will, you know, basically kind of allow you to do the same thing, but you could do it manually if you need to. Okay, so reading through more questions. All right, so Sable Winters asked a, a very important question of, uh, should we wear costumes for Friday's Zoom? So um, I I'm probably won't wear one, but if everyone wants to wear a Halloween costume, we could do that as well for Friday's Zoom in the spirit of the 
holiday coming. It's, I know it's bigger in America than other countries, so and I'll have to go to my my son's school's family fall fun night, which is kind of a Halloween thing. All right, so we see Kai Wen Franklin likes the harmony feature. Uh, so we see a question. Does Loop Mash work in Nuendo 10? Yes. Uh, so Loop Mash is a part of Nuendo 10. So if you haven't played around with it, definitely check it out. We'll give you that feature free for watching the live stream today. I think Jazz Dude's saying it, uh, I bet it exists for six years. It might be 12. So, All right. All right. So, just see uh, from Hugo uh, just asking Is my UR44C supposed to show up? in the inspector. So, you know, I have a UR24C and what you probably need to do is let's say we do a new project. Um, if you used a control room, you may have to switch temporarily disable the control room. And I know we've been trying to get Yamaha to fix this for a long time, but if we come over here to uh, our audio connections. I'm going to temporarily just kind of turn off the control room and I'll set this to not connect it. I'm going to add my output channel here and I'm going to route this to my Steinberg UR24C. And let's say for our input, I just want it to add, you know, input one and two here going to my UR44. 24C, and I'm going to add a mono audio channel. So let's say I want a mono channel. It's we could have it going into you know this defined input, uh, and then once you do that, then you could see all the settings for the UR24C. So unfortunately, you have to disable. And I know this is silly because it's the same company, but the hardware design is kind of done by Yamaha. Um, and they haven't gotten around to kind of changing this, but make sure that you go to the audio connections, uh, disable the control room, uh, and then just, you don't have to disable it, but you could just make sure that your outputs are going, you know, it needs to see that, uh, for the input and output for that function to show up in the program. So once you do that, then I think you'll be all set and you'll see like, the UR44C controls uh, just in the inspector like we just saw. All right, just getting all sorts of emails. All right. All right, and then uh, I think I may have missed this question. Uh, when I open Media Bay, I can't hear anything in the preview section. My output is set to my UR44C. Do I have to change it? So again, just change that in, to, in the control room and not the output. All right, uh, so we just see a question. Uh, when I automate an effect on an insert and move it to a different insert slot on the same channel, I lose the automation. Is there a preference to keep automation when moved to a different slot? I don't think so, but I think you could copy. So let's say if I have uh, an insert here, let me just add in our audio track. All 
or I guess we don't need to do that, but let's say So say I automate the plugin here. We just okay. So we come over here. We have our plugin automation. Okay. So now we'll come over here. We'll look at our. Plugin automation there. So now if I say, and we look at it, we'll see the plugin parameters automate. All right, so if I move this down, all right, so looks, all right, so now we'll see We'll see if this takes, it looks like. All right, so it looks like the inserts kind of carried over when I moved it. So once I do that, so the, the it looks like it's tied. So as I move the plugin in the insert slot, we can see it change and I just activate the read on that. And it looks like that changed. Let me just make sure. So just make sure that when you do that, uh, Taylor, that you open up the plugin and make sure that the read is enabled for the plugin. But it looks like it transferred, you know, like when we look at the lane here, we can see insert six. And then if I move that to another, we see it's on insert three, but the automation is still there and just enable read. And then it looks like it takes so. Uh, you may just have to enable read again on the plugin, but it looks like that works. Okay, so we have uh, this is Dear Logic checking in from Ireland. All right, or Dire Logic. Or it's probably pronounced in some cool Irish way that I'm mispronouncing, but thanks for joining. All right, just trying to find my place as my live stream chat moved. Um, all right, so we see from uh, from Kai Wen Franklin, Greg, my uh, Cubase USB dongle is starting to act up a little scary. Uh, anything on doing away with them in the next release of Cubase? Um, so I believe, you know, they have announced that they will be moving away from the USB e-licensor technology to a new license management system. I think we'll see, you know, some kind of an announcement coming up with more details. So, um, but, you know, so I believe that will kind of be part of the announcement, but I could only speculate. And other people want to save the dongle. Um, All right, so we see from uh, Brianna, can you show how to have an audio track fill a chord track? So if you want um, an audio track to automatically generate the chords, like, you know, where it could do an analysis of the chords in the audio file and then uh, drop that in. Uh, Cubase doesn't have that functionality. You could do it from MIDI, but it's not going to be able to extract uh, a chord track from an audio file. So, all 
All right, uh, so we see from Dan Freeman, uh, how to create a base drop. Um, so if you want to do it on, you know, you know, for maybe like a, like a kind of thing, um, we could do that uh, using the sampler track. So let's say, and kind of using the legato modes in monophonic. So let's say if I have this project here, Okay, so let's say if I have this going on, right? So let's say I have, so, you know, I, I could have my audio play. So if I wanna play like chords, you know, we could do that, but I could also just place, you know, and we could drag any audio file into the sampler track and we could place it into monophonic mode and here we could have a glide amount so if you wanted to just do a uh, so i'll just hold the first key down and then hit the second key so if i wanted that to take a long time for the glide um, But sometimes you may not want it to like you, know, you see that as I hit the second note, it re-triggers from the start of the sample. Uh, if I click on legato mode here, I could just so you could do stuff like that. So if you want that to be a little faster. So if that's the kind of bass drop you want. So you could do stuff like that using the sampler track. So, but let me know if that's the what you want to do, Dan, or if you wanted more for like a uh, electric bass part recording. Um, then you could do something like in loop mash. reading through comments. So thanks for all the great questions. Uh, and if you've learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. And if you um, have not subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that as well. And look forward to seeing a lot of people on Friday's Zoom meetup. All right, so just see from uh, Kai Wen Franklin, uh, have you ever had a problem with the loop button? Uh, I've noticed that sometime when I have the loop button on, Cubase will just ignore it uh, as, if the, as if the loop button was not on. So I haven't had a problem. I've seen sometimes where people may have the loop button on and then they're just kind of playing, you know, outside of the loop and it's not looping. Um, you know, but I, any time that I've seen the loop that's activated, you know, and when you know, it's activated when you see it, not this color, but the bluish color. So when you see the blue color, it'll pretty much always, um, you know, just, I've never had it not loop when loop is turned on, but if you just kind of jump here, the loop could be on and it's like, oh, okay. It's not really following because it's not playing within the looped area. So that's when I've seen people miss it, but I haven't come across that.
All right, so just see, uh, and this is from Dan Freeman, maybe some people could help out. Um, after choosing to allow window to be resized uh, for Waves plugins, they stopped working and I have to reboot. Anyone else experiencing this? So yeah, I mean, that may be kind of systemic to the Waves plugins, but you could also maybe like as it's, you know, maybe it's they're not high DPI compatible if you're running like a 4K screen or a 2K screen. Uh, and it could be something with that. All right, so just see uh, at Greg and anyone else using a Mac computer, are you thinking about going to Mac OS Monterey? I'm generally not one to kind of switch into operating systems early um so like i just got um i you know i just got my mac updated from our corporate it department to big sur uh on thursday um and they were you know the it people were just kind of very concerned about monterey and they wanted everyone to at least be on an operating system that they knew would work before jumping up to monterey but i you know but that's kind of basically with, uh, you know, my school of thought is I tend to personally stay on whatever OS my computer came with as long as I can. So and found that that always has worked well. So, but maybe other people have, uh, have jumped already. Read through comments. Okay. All right, so we see Graham Witcher just checking in. It says, uh, we're sorry to read of your mother's passing. So that's obviously way more important than your live stream. So you'll be in our thoughts. Sorry that happened. Okay, so we see uh, Greg Sordino just saying hello, just saying a word. Thank you for all you do, Greg Undo. So I'm glad it's hopefully helpful. So thank you for the kind words, it means a lot. Okay, reading through some more comments. We see some discussion on new Macs and PCs. Okay, and great to see Ted Springman on the live stream. Thanks for joining. Um, all right, so we see from Jazzy Land. For some reason, when I try to click the right speaker icon, it won't play anymore. Uh, why does it do that? So let's say if we come over here and I grab this speaker. Um, so, you know, it's kind of intended for audio, but let's see if that's maybe could be related to control room. Um, so let's come over here to just our audio connections and I'll just de disable the control room.
So, you know, if you're playing it over a virtual instrument, it may not play, but it seems to work uh, with control room, but you could try to make sure that you have control room activated and see if that makes any difference for you. Okay. Okay, read through comments. Um, okay, so you just see, uh, Greg, I have issues with video playback in Cubase 11. It basically stutters during playing. Uh, what video format is the best? So, you know, video can be a little tricky overall um, just because, you know, like, you know, unlike WAV files, which are consistent, um, you know, from program to program in a WAV file is very consistent. You know, if you could have like, you know, an MP4 video file, but that could be a thousand different variations and codecs within the particular video file. So it's not the video file format, but the codec, the, you know, which is basically the compression and decompression. So let's say if we just kind of start this off, we could say, um, and you could find out which ones are kind of most widely used. And there's a kind of a help center article. So you just say video support in Nuendo, Cubase, WaveLab, Dorco. And this website will kind of give you like, okay, with this container of a .move, you could use these different codecs with an MP4, you want an H.263 or H.264. So you may have to just convert the, uh, the files, you know, to a different codec or to a different container. And if you do it kind of within this particular, um, you know, within this particular matrix, then you should be all fine. And basically what it's doing, you know, it all depends on, you know, cause the video will be compressed and for that to decompress and play back, at that point, you would, you know, need to have the right codec. So different codecs, you know, and again, you know, a dot MOV file may have, you know, a thousand different codecs that are a part of that. So they're not all the same. So, you know, sometimes if it's compressed really heavily, then it has to do a lot of work to decompress it. If it's not compressed heavily, it's just, you know, playing back the movie without a lot of compression, it takes less work, but can take more CPU cycles. So, so check out this website, just look for video support in Nuendo Cubase and uh, WaveLab and Dorco, and that should help kind of figure out the codecs you made. There's a lot of freeware utilities that you can convert as well. All right, so we see uh, Avid has a program that you can get certified using Pro Tools. Does Steinberg offer the same for Cubase? So there isn't necessarily like a certification. We do have certified training centers, but you know we found that a lot of it um, was just kind of almost like an educational, uh, we'll call it an educational business opportunity to you know for stuff that you could learn by yourself um, and. You know, most people, you know, would never, you know, a certification wouldn't really make a difference in getting a job or anything like that. So I think if you just kind of learn Cubase, you know, probably coming to live streams, you'll learn a lot more about Cubase than being certified in other programs. So. All right, so we just see a question. Um, can we import tempo information from a WAV file? So, you know, generally it's gonna automatically be extracted. 
So, you know, it doesn't have to be imported. So, and you could see, so once you import an audio file, uh, you know, if you go to the pool window, you'll see under tempo, you'll see kind of all the different tempo information that is there. So that should automatically be carried over when the file is imported. You'll see it, uh, you'll see it indicated in the pool window. Uh, right there what the tempo is for that particular file if it has the metadata for the tempo information. All right, so I just see from uh, Ian Hurley, um, Cubase doesn't recognize native instrument software such as the new 25 instrument. So, you know, obviously we have lots of our users are running native instruments. So make sure A, that you, um, you know, that you didn't install the 32-bit version because we'll need 64-bit versions. Uh, I haven't tried the 25 instrument, but I'm assuming that it would work. You know, make sure... Uh, you know, I know they've just started releasing some VST3 stuff, like finally, but uh, make sure that if it's a VST2 plugin that you go to your VST plugin manager and you may have to click on the little settings cogwheel here. And if you do that, make sure that you actually have the path of where your plugins are set up. Um, but I'm sure that it'll work in your Cubase without any issue. Okay, so I just see from uh, Benny saying Nuendo don't find loop match. So it's loop mash. So if you look for that, um, but here's uh, Nuendo 10.3. I'll just boot this up really quickly. So we'll take a look here. So we'll add our instrument track, and then under synth, um, you'll see loop mash. And then, so it works in Nuendo 10. So I think it originally came out around uh, Cubase 5 maybe Cubase 4, Cubase 5, so it's probably 20 years old, or uh, it's probably, yeah, at least 13, 14 years old, so you should be able to see it in your Nuendo. All right, uh, so we just see a question. Um, how to import tempo information from a WAV file without tempo, tempo detection. So generally, you know, the audio files themselves as metadata will have one static value. You know, Cubase has a way of, if you do tempo detection to take the tempo definition, like the tempo changes of the audio file, but you know, there's nothing to import uh, because it's not part of, you know, it's not really, most programs, if you if you let us know like where the tempo is coming from, but you know, I think Cubase is the only program I know that can really you know write uh, like a tempo definition of changing tempos within a file. But if not, you know, as we just mentioned a little while ago, you know, you could see it directly in uh, the pool window as well.
Okay, just reading through. I just have to send a text to my wife for work. All right, so let me just jump back in. Okay, so we see question uh, promotions page on Steinberg has been rather empty for a while. Uh, I hope this is temporary and that there is new deals coming. So, you know, in the, in the U.S. we'll, you know, have uh, like one of the big things, you know, to, you know, who knows if, um, you know, what will happen on Black Friday. But, you know, so, but check that out around that time in the U.S. So towards the end of... Uh, November, so. Okay, just my chat field jumped on me. All right, I think I'm back to where I was. All right, so we see uh, from Hugo just saying, uh, what does he mean? Change it in the control room. Uh, can someone help? So, you know, if you're not, you know, so if you're, if you have Cubase Pro, you know, come over here to the audio connections, you'll see a control room tab from the studio menu. And at this point, you want to enable the control room functionality and add right click to add a monitor. And at that point, just, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, at that point, just come right over here and make sure that the monitor is, you know, that you have your audio interface routings there as opposed to the outputs. All right, so you see from uh, Cubase, from Jan and Cubase Index, it says we're very close to 100 likes, uh, and wants, he wants everyone to smash the like button. Okay, so we just see a uh, question. I am a media composer and I often have different cues in different sessions, uh, but at the end to compile all the cues in one mother session and have all these cues have different tempos, uh, is there an easier way of compiling the different cues without manually putting in every single tempo change? Um, so, you know, you could, import the tempo tracks from the projects. So, you know, if you come over here, so, you know, you could, you know, from each of the projects, just export a tempo track. And then for the new project, you know, you could just import the tempo track. And, you, you know, when you import it, you could just do it, you know, based on the cursor position. So, you know, just, uh, so it would be one project at a time. So you could import and export the tempo tracks independently and have kind of one queue with everything in it. All right, great to see Randy Lee in the live stream. All right, so I just see a question. Uh, what is a digital pitch bay? Um, so I've seen like, you know, digital patch bays where they're actually 
um, you know, a patch bay that could be controlled, uh, like through MIDI sometimes or different, um, you know, different types of, you know, controls, but I haven't really heard of a digital pitch bay, but it may exist. All right, so we just see, uh, but the problem, and it's going back to probably our tempo question, it says, but the problem is the tempo detection is not accurate. It makes too many tempo events than what is required. So often when you do like tempo changes and you see a lot of activity, there is fluctuation within the actual temp, you know, within the tempo. So you may see that, you know, some people call it a groove where the, you know, the measures are speeding up and slowing down. And, you know, once you do a tempo detection, you can very easily just kind of adjust it as necessary. So, you know, if it looks like it's doing a lot of, you know, figuring out a lot, you know, there's a lot of data there, it's because often, you know, there's going to be a lot of data. So, but you could manually adjust as well. So if you wanted to come here, so let's say we have this and I want to do just a quick tempo detection and you could do it manually using the time warp tool. But, you know, once you come here, say you go to a project and tempo detection. So, and then you could also just, you know, smooth, um, tempo detection so you know but once you kind of do the tempo detection of the audio it puts you into the time warp tool and you could just manually adjust <clears throat> accordingly so you could say no it's really right here where the tempo is or where the beat falls and this allows you to manually adjust and as you do the manual adjustment it will automatically recalculate the tempo changes afterward so you know sometimes if it looks like it's doing a lot of different tempo changes at that point, you know, there are often a lot of, you know, different tempo changes and it's not uncommon, even if you think it's very well, you know, steady, perfectly programmed. All right, so we have Steve from Manchester in the UK checking in. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we just see, uh, hi, I'm having issues with Cubase using too much of my RAM memory, uh, using 90 to 95% with not so many tracks. Uh, is there something I can do to resolve the situation? I have 32 gigs of RAM. So, you know, it, it could really depend, you know, like one orchestral sample library may take, you know, 64 gigs of RAM. So when you say just a couple of tracks, it could, you know, there's some ways of, you know, if you let us know if it's just audio tracks, you know, so, you know, that would that information, or if you're using samples, like an orchestral sample library, that could take a lot of memory. But a lot of times, you know, if you're using orchestral stuff, you know, you could go into, you know, even like, uh, I think you could do it inside of Howie and Sonic SE, where, you know, you could purge unused samples. Um, but if you kind of come over here, you could, um, you know, just kind of switch and, you know, actually do you know, in Halion, they call it Ram save. So a lot of instruments will allow you to kind of do an analysis. And if those samples aren't being utilized in the production, you could just, you know, unload those particular, uh, memories so you know and see if you you know if, if you don't know what track is causing it you know try to come right over here and just choose to enable right click and enable and disable tracks and then you could see you know oh this one track is taking 20 gigs of memory for some reason and then you could isolate it and so once you disable a track it's going to unload from the processor and from memory Okay.
Okay, so just saying uh, in Logic, there's a feature called apply region tempo to project tempo, which basically extracts the tempo information, embed it in an audio file and apply it uh, rather than analyzing tempo from scratch. But if there's tempo changes, it's going to kind of do that all the already so you know it's so that information is not going to be embedded so but you know if you come here and let's say you know if you had like a, a drum loop let me just jump to another project here just to show this so you know i'm not sure if you're working kind of loop based material or like a live performance and that information could be helpful uh but let's say if i jump to this project You know, we have what we call the beat calculator. So let's say if I play this and I will just kind of count the beats. So let's say I'll do it at a more reasonable tempo. So let's say that's 16 beats, so it's four measures in four four. So I could select this and go to the beat calculator and it, you know, and you say this is 16 beats a minute. And um, at that point it will say, okay, I want to put this at the tempo track start. Um, so, you know, you could just come right over there and just apply that to the particular file. So, um, and that sounds like probably what the logic function you describe is doing. So, um, but again, you know, I think if you had a varying tempo that, you know, that tempo metadata isn't embedded in the audio file and it's going to be one static value. So. Okay, so I see, hello, I've put together a sound I like for a track. How can I copy all the settings to use in a new project? Uh, thanks, love your videos. So let's say if it's a, like a virtual instrument, you know, and you say, okay, this is awesome. All I would have to do is to right click and I can say save track preset. So um, I said, this is cool, awesome Hallian. Six live stream. So now when I could go over here, I could just say, okay, I want it to go to my media bay. Let's go to user presets and we could go to, you know, VST instrument presets, or we could go to track presets and say, okay, let's go to VST instruments. And I say, oh, here's my Hallian six live stream I did. That was so awesome in the next one. So, you know, anything that you do, you could just kind of drag and drop, just right click and choose to save the track preset. And then you could load that into any other project. All right, so we see Ian Hurley also has uh, loops being, the loop enabled uh, being ignored sometimes. All right, so we see uh, Ian Hurley just asking, how do you join the Zoom meetup? So if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de or on Friday's uh, live stream, I will po I'll paste uh, the Zoom meetup information. So I will just put that in the comments field. And then we'll go about two hours of the live stream and about two hours of the Zoom meetup as well.
Okay, so you can see is uh, CC121 an interface? Uh, so the CC121 is a controller. It has a single uh, 100 millimeter motorized fader, kind of the same exact fader you can get in a Yamaha DM2000. It'll have kind of a channel strip, an AI knob, transport, uh, EQ function, which can also control quick controls as well as your aux sends, um, the AI knob so you could hover over parameters and user controls and kind of uh, like your control room volume on one really well-made controller. So it's not an audio interface, but a controller. All right, so to see uh, in Cubase 11 Pro using Groove Agent 5, I drag a MIDI drum pattern into the project. It plays a fill pattern. Tried a different main pattern and responds the same. I tried to reload kit, still the same. What gives? All right, so some of the patterns that you're dragging over, you know, what, there's one little button that you could click to prevent this from happening is once you're in the pattern mode, you just want to click on this and this will assign the MIDI port uh, that's separate from the patterns, um, you know, from the notes. So once you do that, click on that little MIDI icon and then drag it over and then you'll be all set. So that puts the patterns onto their own separate unique MIDI port as opposed to um, just having the patterns that are triggering notes, you know, that will re-trigger patterns. So just enable that and that should fix it for you. Okay, so we see uh, from JVI, uh, when I make a new instrument track as default, it's always on top. Is there a preference to change so that's not always on top as standard? So let me just add one here. So I'm not sure if this is... So let's say I'll add a pad chop. And we'll see if this is in always on top mode. So I'm just gonna uncheck always on top and add a retro log here to that. All right, now there is a preference that may affect this. So let me just come over here. Maybe the open effect editor uh, after loading it. Okay, so let's see if this I'll add a pad shop or a different instrument, just keep it simpler. So now it will not open the editor. And so, and it could be, you know, maybe I just right click to have the instrument open, but you know, maybe see if that will help you JVI. I'll take a look, see if there's other preferences. Oh, plugin editor is always on top. So, so now if you come here, so just do that preference. So go under preferences to VST plugins, plugin editors always on top. You could uncheck that. Okay. Thanks for all the great questions. See how we're doing on time. Okay, we're doing well.
All right, so we see, um, I also make tutorial about Cubase. We need channel rack in Cubase, please. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, the channel rack, if that's going to be just the channel strip, you know, where we can see our noise gate, you know, different compressors, you know, de -er, envelope shaper, different saturations, different limiters that can all be freely uh, change the signal flow order of. So I'm not sure if that's what you mean by channel rack or not. But if not, let me know if I misunderstood. All right, so we see from Alessandro, uh, happy to finally make it to one of these streams live. Any news on Apple Silicon support? So. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of changes with new processors, but um, I know the development team is working on it, and there's lots of third-party components that you know may not be updated. So um, you know, so there are some things that you know uh, are it's being actively worked on. So I'm not sure if they've you know have an official announcement, but you know they are working on it with lots of effort. Okay, so we just see uh, how to record with live with no latency in Cubase 11 Pro. I also make tutorial. I'm struggling, bro. I need help. So if you're recording, you know, so some of the things that can help with, um, I'll just, I think my Mac was listening to me. Um, so if you, you know, one of the things that you could do with your, you know, so you have to figure out, you know, latency can be caused by, you know, two main things. One is going to be a buffer size. So we could go to your audio interface, go to its control panel, and you could decrease the buffer. So a lower buffer means lower latency, and lower latency means that it's working on your computer harder. So like I'm running about seven milliseconds of latency, which is usually, you know, more than adequate for most tracking purposes. Now, sometimes when you add plugins into your project, so let's say if we get to the mix console and we start adding like a monitoring chain, let's say like a multiband compressor here. So let's say I have two multiband compressors and I want to see this and I go to play notes and there's a lot of latency. Uh, you could enable in the Cubase Pro version, there is a channel latency function. And I could look at each track and see how much latency is on particular tracks. So I can see on this, on with those two multiband compressors, those each have 123 milliseconds of latency. So that could be problematic if you're playing in live. So to quickly bypass plugins that impose a lot of latency, what we could do is just click on in the lower left hand corner we have this constrained delay compensation so if you turn that on what that will do is take any of the plugins that have a lot of latency and automatically just bypass them so that the effect plugins that you have in the project aren't adding additional latency over than what your audio interface buffer is set to so when you just kind of went to the wrong window sorry about that so so you know try just to check and you know come right over here and just kind of turn on the constraint delay compensation and see if that works okay so to see um All right, so I see from Steve, uh, I made an expression map for IK Multimedia's Moto Bass, uh, but when I try to use it, I get no sound. I've double and triple checked to make sure I did everything right and can't find the problem. Um, I don't have a copy of that particular plugin. Um, you know, sometimes when doing, you know, out of curiosity, when you're doing like an expression map, um, you know, try, 
like when you're doing it, you know, so let's say if I come here, try adding an empty slot to the very beginning. So to the very top one, because sometimes when it gets reset, it may do that. But if you want to send me, um, you know, like if you want to send me your expression map, I could see if I could get a license. I have a friend that works at IK. Um, but you know, or I could see if there is one that's floating around as well, but I, I don't know that plugin. Um, but you know, if it's getting, you know, if you could play it without the expression map and it's working and then the expression map is on, you know, I could maybe able to kind of take a look if you have like, if all the key switches are set, uh, or defined in the documentation, then I might be able to kind of take a look at it so but you could try emailing me uh at uh club cubase at steinberg.de um hi greg can we import tempo information from wave like how it's possible in midi so once again most wave files don't have tempo information like varying like tempo variations you know as with midi uh you know the midi like a MIDI file itself has that information. So generally in WAV files, tempo information, tempo changes aren't part of the actual metadata of the audio file, so. Okay, uh, so to see question, uh, Greg, I downloaded or rather signed up for the Cubase trial, let's say Wednesday, how long before the code expires if unused? So I think the trial version will start, um, like, you know, I think it's 30 days for Cubase. Um, so, and I think it starts as soon as the license is activated. So, um, so it will be 30 days from, so if you haven't used it, it's when the license is activated and then it will uh, start to the clock at that point. Okay. Um, okay. So just see a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, Lisis SR16 drum machine from 30 years ago. I remember that. I think it came out in 1989. That was my my first drum machine. It was an HR16. It's my first piece of MIDI equipment. So, uh, is there a question? Uh, is there a way of importing an audio pattern then extracting each element of the kit to separate lanes? Uh, apologize if you covered this subject. Um, so if you're just recording the audio, you know, like you may be able to do something through spectral layers, but you know, what I would do is just come over here, you know, so, you know, you could synchronize that drum machine via MIDI clock. So if you have a MIDI interface, you could go to your transport and go to your project synchronization setup. Um, and then what you want to do is send MIDI clock out to it. Uh, and then at that point you could record the pattern as MIDI. So let's say if I have like this whole pattern, so you may want, you know, you, you probably have a lot more flexibility in the MIDI domain, but we could turn that into audio. So let's say if I had this, um, and I had the MIDI, what we could do with MIDI parts is actually come. And if you go to dissolve part, from MIDI, we could say separate pitches. So let's say this is my drum part that we have programmed here. So this is my drum beat. And what I want to do is to separate the pitches. So, uh, and again, go to MIDI to dissolve part. So I will just select it here. And we'll say separate pitches, and then this will automatically split each of the notes onto their own track. Now, if you wanted to capture the audio performance of it to split up, at this point, what you could do is just say, okay, I'm gonna solo just a kick. And as we play, 
and then record it as audio. Then the next time I could go to, you know, the hi-hat and listen to the hi-hat. So this way we could solo the track. It's going to play one note that that can be recorded and multi-tracked. So, um, so that would be the best approach if you needed to break the kick um, out. Um, you could, you know, I think that had four outputs, you know, so if you wanted to just, you know, synchronize it by MIDI clock, like we showed in the transport, um, and then take the, you know, route the kick to output one, the snare to output two, the, you know, a hi-hat, and, you know, maybe one tom, an output four, and then, you know, hit play, that will synchronize, and then, you know, capture those as audio, then do the other toms, do the symbols, and kind of break it apart like that as well. All right, you see Michael Teams has a nice comment saying, I've learned more from the live stream here than I've ever learned from any other DAW program, and I'm not the youngest here. So thanks for the kind words. Hope the live streams are helpful for people. Okay, so we see Nick is saying, uh, Cubase does recognize the Native Instruments 25. You installed it today, worked perfectly. All right, we see Pablo is back. We see Tim Weinheimer saying Greg is definitely QA certified. I actually don't even have a certification, so I'll have to I'll have to reach out to Steinberg see if I could be a certified trainer. Just finding my spot. All right, so we see Benny just saying now it works. So that's great. All right, so I just see, uh, hi, Greg. Uh, I'm unable to record the MIDI CC11 when using MIDI input transform from CC7 volume to CC11, but it works from CC1 uh, to CC11. Okay, just out of curiosity, um, you know, if it's like a fader that's on your MIDI controller, try going to your studio setup and see if you go to like your uh, quick controls, if you're, if that's already kind of being used in one of the VST quick controls. Um, so you may want to just out of curiosity, just set your like your quick controls to not connected temporarily. Cause if it's being used in quick controls, it may kind of take that particular uh, fader that may be kind of like, we'll consider it like spoken for. So if it's being defined somewhere else in the program, it may prevent that from being, the ability of that being remapped uh, to other controllers. So make sure that you don't have that particular CC7 uh, defined anywhere under a generic remote or a quick control out of curiosity and see and if you let us know that. But sometimes like a quick control, once it's been defined, it kind of will hold on to that particular controller. Um, so I just see, is there a way to make Steinberg's version of compressor easy, like Logic Pro? So I think that the Steinberg compressor is pretty easy. Um, so let's say if I want to just, just come over here. So I don't know the Logic Pro compressor at all, but you know, um, and we have multiple compressors. So let's say if I just wanted to take this, um, 
and I'm just gonna... All right, so say if I have this going on, just go to my control room and let me just activate my cycle. All right, so if I wanted to just come over here to my inserts, you know, like even if you use the stock compressor, so I'm not sure, you know, so here we can see kind of our dynamic range. So if I say, okay, let's adjust the ratio. And if I wanted this to, it's pretty standard and we could have makeup gain as well. So if you wanted to kind of, kind of have it squashed, you know, you could adjust accordingly. So I think that's, you know, pretty compressor 101 for interfacing. So, but if you let me know if there's any particular part of the, you know, and there's other compressors that you could use as well. So let's say, you know, if you just go under dynamics, there's gonna be, you know, a vintage compressor, a tube compressor, and you know, if it's, uh, you know, if it's still, I know, if, you know, if it's still like a little uh, hard to understand, you know, it's like load up different track presets and start to work with it. But I think like the stock, Compressor is very effective and, you know, easy conceptually to kind of work with. But let me know if there's a particular thing that you find hard with it. So we see Benny's just saying the best live stream. Thanks. That's good. Otherwise, I'm wasting a lot of time during my week for it. So. Okay, so we see uh, from Dan Freeman, uh, Greg tried using control room for the first time, added my UR44, uh, couldn't figure out how to mix the guitar. I was recording to be louder than the rest of the song without affecting my mix. Okay, so let's show you. Okay, so let's say if I was doing maybe like a headphone mix for someone. So to make the guitar like a more me type of mix. So let's say we have this and I wanted to do maybe let's have a good time. create different uh, cue mixes for people. So, you know, so what you want to do first is come over here and we're going to actually just kind of create, uh, go to your audio connections uh, and go to the control room and I'll just add a new cue mix. So we'll say, okay, this will be for bass. Okay, and we'll make this a stereo cue mix. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm gonna select all of my channels in my project. And make sure that you see racks um, and that you have Q sends. Uh, so you should see the racks here. If you don't see the racks, I just ran into this uh, with Taylor just the other day, but make sure that you have the racks part visible from the setup window. And then what you, what you want to do is make sure that the Q sends are active and we could select our Q sends here. So we have our three Q sends. And now what I want to do is uh, I have all of my tracks selected. So I want to, we'll just right click here and we'll say all cues and we'll say uh, we want to activate the cue sends across all of my tracks. And I want to use the current mix levels across all of my tracks. And then we could, so what this is gonna do is mimic the fader mix positions here across all the channels. 
And now I want to use a current pan settings. So we'll just do this. So we could say that now I wanted to take, um, I never promised you. let's come over here to our bass track. So I want the bass to be louder in the bass player's headphone mix. So now I could come over here and then you could just kind of switch between the different cue mixes here. So as soon as we just want to do the cue mix, you could say, okay, we're just gonna monitor the cue mix. So this is my alternate mix. So, so now when I come over here, I could just say, let's listen to the mix. And if I wanted QMix 1 to be like drums, I could select all of my drum tracks. And then I could enable my Q link and I'll just kind of take all these up. So now I could listen to the Q mix here. This is the drummer's mix. And say drummer's like, oh, I want more bass in my mix. And the bass player is like, I want more kick drum in my mix. I could just take the kick right there. So and I'll disable Q link and I want to send more kick. So that's how you could create kind of different Q mixes from your mix. And then if you wanted to feed each of these to headphone amps, you would come over here into the studio, go to the audio connections and route out the Q mix to the musician to outputs three and four. So you would say, okay, let's go to our bass and send this to outputs three and four or to you know your second headphone output on your UR44. So. All right, so we have a question from Jan, and since he does such a lovely service for the community with the Cubase Index, uh, he just says, global mute solo, read and write. Uh, when should I use these and when should I avoid them? Can Greg discuss these icons? So we often kind of see these kind of at the top. Um, so a lot of times, like, you know, let's say you have one track soloed. So let's say you're over here um, and you're kind of playing along. <laughs> and you're going crazy, it's like, oh, I have one track that's soloed. Uh, and I, you know, in, in the heat of the moment, you can't find it. So this is when it's good to say, okay, I want to deactivate all global solo states. Or we have different tracks are muted. So, or if you don't want automation to play back or, you know, like you select a track accidentally and you have write turned on and you don't want to necessarily look through 300 tracks, these global buttons here will allow you to just say, okay, you know, where there's automation, I could write automation across multiple tracks. I could, you know, just, you know, enable right globally. And anytime, anytime I touch my control surface, you know, it will be automated because all the tracks are automated without having to do it one by one by one. All right, so we just see uh, an audio track with piano. How do I turn it into a MIDI file so I can use the grand? Um, 
So, um, you know, there some tools will allow you to do this. I think the the large version of Melodyne will allow you to do that. I think sometimes, you know, the, the quality by time you fix a lot of mistakes that may be kind of imposed by it, but there isn't a built-in tool for Cubase and it could be pretty uh, advanced dealing with harmonics. And if the piano is, you know, has a note out of tune here or there, that could be really tricky for it. So there really isn't a way to do it uh, kind of for polyphonic material, but you know, you could maybe investigate something through Melodyne. People have had mixed results with it. Okay. So we see, uh, according to Michael Teams, I need an energy drink. So, you know, sometimes I need, I try not to drink too much before a live stream because then I have to go four hours without using the bathroom. So, all right. Maybe I'm low energy today. All right. All right. So we see um, Jeff Sabelski is just saying, I guess, kind of uh, toward Jazz Dude says, I can use Vienna Instrument Pro in Halion 6 uh, bypassing the ensemble which you use. I use multiple. Uh, HS in the Cubase slot racks. I don't think you could run um, Vienna in Halion 6, but I don't have Vienna. I don't have a license for Vienna. All right, so we have a question. Uh, an interesting option is workspaces, uh, but I still can't figure out what purpose I need it. Uh, Greg, uh, how often do you use workspaces? So I don't use them that much, but I've set them up for people, um, you know, and with workspaces is, you know, we could just come over here and have different, you know, if you find yourself, you know, in, in my personal studio, I use two screens. I always have like a mixer on one and my editor on one and like VST instruments will open in one screen, you know, so different editor windows will open in different screens. Um, but if I had like a single screen, you know, I say, oh, I just want to immediately go to this view where I could see, you know, different functions. So what a workspace is going to allow us to do is to just set up, you know, different views of different things. So let's say I want it uh to have my mixer set up so say i come over here to mix console one um and i wanted this set up here and my cubase arrangement page set up here and i wanted to split it like this at this point i could add a workspace and these workspaces could be based on a project or they could be global so i could just come over here we'll call this october All right, and I'll just say, let's make it a project workspace for now. Um, so let's say if I was here and I did, you know, and I painfully set up like, you know, four windows to do something, I could now just kind of come right over here and say, oh, let's go to October 26th view. And then you could have, you know, different windows kind of appear in different areas that are pre-configured. So if you find yourself like constantly moving windows to get them configured, to see them in a specific way that you want to go back to, that's when you could use like workspaces to accomplish that. All right, so I just see from uh, Termo Nuclear War it says Cubase is like made for a fusion of music directions because I love it. So, you know, th and that's, you know, we have, you know, like all sorts of, you know, varied users, you know, so uh, it, it's, you know, it's really interesting at times. So I remember one time I had like a really big EDM artist and then, you know, I got a call like 10 minutes later from Snoop Dogg and then from Donny Osmond and all these people are using Cubase, you know, but completely different tasks and different workflows.
All right, so we have a question. Uh, can you change the properties of an existing track empty from instrument to audio or MIDI? Um, so, you know, once you kind of define what type of track that is, um, but let's say if we have an instrument track, um, so let's say if I come here, I'll just jump over to this project here. You know, it, not necessarily an empty, but if I wanted to kind of take a instrument track and turn it into an audio track, you could do that kind of through the uh, render in place functionality. So let's say uh, if I'm here and I see like urban ballads here, so I have All right, so if I wanted to take this, you know, so not when it's necessarily a blank track or an empty, but I could take like this instrument track here and if we go to render in place and we go to the render settings. So let me just select just the track itself. So when I do this and we go to render in place to the render settings at this point, I'll just say uh, for the source events, Wait, let me just see if I make sure I don't have anything else selected here. Then I could say remove source tracks. So when I click on render in place, it'll take this instrument track. It's going to render it slightly underneath and then erase the instrument track and just turn that directly into audio. So, but not, you know, once you kind of pick an instrument or an audio track, you know, it's, you know, you, you kind of go down that path, but you can sometimes, you know, work back and forth, but you know, it's really not a, usually hard to actually, uh, to, to, um, you know, to start with empty tracks, so. Okay, so we see JVI's, the plugin editor is always on top, works like a treat. Reading through comments here. more through I know we have questions that were sent in we'll see if we can get to those so we see Pablo as a friend who's a title of a Steinberg trainer or something like that so that's good All right, so with that, I'm gonna to go to some of the questions that were mailed in. So I know we had a number of questions, so we'll see if we get through these. All right, let me 
go to a particular project here quickly. Thanks for all the great questions and discussions. Okay, so we had a question. Um, so our first question that was mailed in is how to uh, batch export mono and stereo files at the same time. Okay. Okay, so let's say in this uh, project here, I'll just move this out of the way. I have a mono base, and I'll make sure I'm not gonna kill everyone volume wise. So let's say, Uh, so I have a kick here that's mono, and I have like a drum loop that is stereo, and a little synth thing that's in stereo. So the question was how to do like a, a channel batch export and not have, have the mono file stay mono and the stereo file stay stereo. So if I wanted to do this, we would come over here to go to file to export audio mix down. And as we do our export audio mix down, um, we're going to choose multiple. So what I want to do is just come over here. Let me just Just select these, okay. So let's say these will now be, and what we wanna do, so we see mono and stereo files. And under the effects area here, what I want to do is just choose disabled dry. And that will keep the mono ones mono and the stereo ones stereo. Uh, I will have this automatically insert it into the project. So when I come over here, we'll say create audio track. Uh, and at this point, I'm gonna add it to the queue. So we'll just come right over here and we'll start our queue export. And now we'll see that our, you know, mono files or stay mono and stereos will stay stereo. And it's be, if we run this through like an effects, like a stereo effects group, this mono track, and then we choose to, from the export audio mix down, you know, if we wanted to include like the inserts in the strip, that could, you know, if there's, if, you know, if on a mono track that would work, but if we do sends and the sends are stereo, then our mono tracks would turn into mono. And in previous versions to 11, um, it would, you know, you could route the mono tracks to a mono output and the stereo tracks to a stereo output. But if you wanted to just maintain the channel width, I think you disabled will do it. I believe that the uh, inserts and strip will also do it. And it also takes into account like maybe the, you know, if you wanted to incorporate, you know, the groups and the master effects and sends, you could do it there as well. So that's what you need to do. All right, so we had a question. Um, is there a way to save the snap on off state in a workspace? Uh, if I turn snap off and update the workspace, it doesn't seem to include that. So next time I choose the workspace to snap is back on again. Uh, if snap is not included, I would love to ask for that as a feature request. Thanks, uh, and this is from Mark from Heron Island Studio. So currently the snap you know, we can think of the workspaces as being more for the, the window layouts and positions, not necessarily uh, taking into account the particular functions that are active. Like I wouldn't necessarily want to have, you know, in ha you know, recalling the state of different things within a workspace could be tricky. Um, and it's a weird road to go down because, you know, you know let's say, if you were playing the, the file and you saved a workspace, do you want the playback to start every time you opened up a workspace or do you want it to be, do you want it to switch tools 
when you're in a particular workspace. Um, I'll, I'll make sure it gets passed along as kind of a feature request, but I think it could be dangerous. Uh, you know, that just, you know, learning to hit the letter J quickly um, is like, you know, something that you'll, you know, choose to do or to turn, you know, to enable or disable as you're doing your editing. Um, so I think it makes sense not to include that in a workspace um, and think of the ramifications of, you know, if everything, if you, you know, with that, if you want it, like the plugin, the tool, if you had the scissors tool active, you know, if you recalled while you took this, the workspace, do you want it to switch to the scissors tool um, because of that? So, but I'll pass it along regardless. Okay, so we had a question. Uh, hi, Greg, I want to use Cubase for live performance. I want to trigger audio files and send video uh, to a screen through the laptop to VGA output. Is it possible? Can you explain how to do it? So if you have video files, your video files can output. So if you come to, let's say we import a video, let me just do this really quickly. So we import a video file. So as soon as I am here, we could have our video file. And if we go to the video file, so let's say we hit F8, uh, and then you could right click and go to full screen mode for the video. Um, so, and it, you could send that out, but a VGA connection, uh, it just sends video. So the VGA port doesn't physically send any audio. So it's, it's kind of like, the analog portion of the video gets sent out of a VGA port. So unlike an HDMI, which couples the audio and video from the HDMI, um, the VGA port doesn't transmit audio. So you need to do that through an audio interface, but the video you could definitely uh, send out the VGA port full screen. Okay, so... Um, so I think this is from Dan Freeman. Um, just let me see if it was. Okay, it just uh, it says I'm, I'm attaching my template. Uh, so let me just open up the template here. Okay, so we see kind of lots of um, different settings here. So we just kind of look at it. Uh, I used two, uh, I used two physical guitars when recording each one could be clean, distorted, special effects, lead, etc. Also, I have an option for one guitar to already be set up in the left ear or center, um, the other guitar right ear or center. So I have a lot of options with plugins. Uh, I'm using three effects tracks per guitar folder. Each effects track uh, uses different amp and cab settings. This, uh, the idea of three tracks to emulate three physical cabs. Uh, covering low, mid, and high ranges, and be able to pan different for depth. Uh, I'm still trying to dial in uh, a go-to bass sound. I expect to have some setup for picking, slapping, soft, hard, etc. Uh, I started with Cubase plugins, but I think you're going to others or use both. Uh, I've noticed um, lots of options for bass seems to be a resource hog. Uh, I'm kind of making a VST per type of guitar sound, and I do that using folders. Since I don't always need every folder sound in every project, it can still consume processing resources. Uh, so the question is, is there a way I could do this differently? I thought maybe I could somehow use a template or preset of the folder containing the audio effects and bus and then add them somehow as needed, or maybe export all tracks under the folder, then import as needed. So one of the things that you could do if you're not using the particular track for that project, you know, is just to come over here and just say, you know, uh, select the tracks. So say, okay, I'm not using these and just right click and disable the tracks. And that could, you know, just simply disable the particular tracks. So if you wanted to come over here, we could just say, okay, I, and then that particular track is not taking any of the processing power. Another method you could do if you're using VST3 plugins, and we showed this a little bit earlier, if you go to the preferences to plugins, 
Um, you could just say suspend VST3 plugin processing when no audio signals are received. So if they're using the VST3 versions, if you, you know, have that checked, then, you know, it's not going to take any processing power until there's an audio file that's being processed through those plugins. So I think, that, you know, those two methods could work very well. Um, you could also, you know, I know many people will take a whole thing uh, here and, you know, save it as uh, like a track archive. So you could export uh, the, the tracks, export selected tracks, and then choose to import uh, a track archive. So those are a couple of things you could do to help with that. Okay, so we just see, uh, I recorded tracks at bar two. Uh, this is a question. Uh, I recorded tracks at, at bar two and inserted space and events, which pushed the original events to bar 60. When I removed unused events from the pool, uh, then I see an event I need to change. I don't know how to find that event in the project window because it only shows the original starting position. Okay, so let me just come over here. So let's say if we have, let me just, okay, so let's say if we have, I'll just revert this quickly. All right, so if you wanted to update kind of the timestamp of the audio files, is that if that's what you're using, there is a function for that. So we'll just kind of go through this real quick, get the template loaded up that we just looked at. Okay, so as I look at this, so let's say I'm looking at the particular files in the pool window. Uh, and we can see that their origin time as we look at this is all going to be set to zero, zero, zero. And I move these files later in the project. So let's say I just move these to past one minute. And what I want to do here is you go to audio. All you have to do is as you select um, the files, go to audio, and then you could just say, Uh, just go to update. Let me just. But there's an update origin feature. So if I come here, maybe I had updated already. But um, so let's say if I come here, so it's, I'll just go right now to 130. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and record on these three tracks. All right, we'll just do these two tracks. All right, so, and we look at their time position. So we'll go to the media and we'll look at our pool window so we'll see that we're gonna have two of the tracks, um, their origin time, like around 136 and 139. So I'm gonna move these two files and then go to audio menu and update origin. So instead of being 136 and 139, we can now go to the pool window and we see that they're 149 and 152. So just select the files and then just update the origin time. And then the origin time would then be reflected on a new position and time that they were moved to. All right, uh, so we see a question. Uh, is there a preference to always keep Q-Link on or a macro that could uh, be triggered upon opening a project? So, you know, it's not, you know, all you have to do to enable Q-Link, again, is just uh, alter option plus shift, and that will enable it. So, you know, and it could be, you know, and I think it makes sense for a lot of the functions for that to be turned on kind of not by default. 
because it could be okay i have uh, a number of tracks selected and you know now i've changed you know the input here uh, and now because Q-Link was on, you know, all these tracks are now set to the iPad as my input. Or when I come over here and I adjust the EQ for, you know, particular tracks, you know, I have this and I adjust the EQ for one of them that I accidentally have adjusted the EQ for, you know, all of the different tracks in the project. So, it, you know, so... You know, it's really all you have to do when you're using Q-Link. So there isn't a preference to have it automatically turned on because there's a lot of, you know, things that could go horribly wrong unexpectedly by having that on. But, you know, you just enable it just by hitting alter option uh, plus shift and that will turn it on and off. So I don't think that's too much to just kind of turn on because it's, it's something that you need to be aware of every time. Okay, so I think we covered this one already. Okay, so we have some questions on uh, kind of using a Behringer X-Touch in WaveLab as a control surface. So let me go ahead and open up WaveLab. All right, so um, so and let me just jump over here to this project. Um, okay, so the question, um, I'm trying to set up my Behringer X-Touch 1 control surface to work with WaveLab Pro. I've gotten most of it to work. Uh, but I've run into a couple of problems. Um, on page 26 in the manual, it is stated for all commands that can be assigned to a keyboard shortcut, a MIDI trigger can also be assigned. I've been searching for create generic marker and move cursor to start a file. I found them under preferences slash shortcuts and I figured out how to change the shortcut key, but how can I add a MIDI trigger key? All right, so let's say if I just want to do new, um, I'll just open up a wave file here. Okay. So let's say I'll just kind of have this. Go. All right. So let's say, um, so how we set this up is you go to your file and let's go to preferences. Uh, so when we go to remote control, what you want to make sure is that we have your MIDI port where your controller is set up directly here, defined and active. So, and you want this to say MIDI shortcuts. Okay. So make sure that this may default to MIDI device one, choose this to be MIDI shortcuts. Then when we go to shortcuts, um, so let's say I want to look at marker. Um, so say create generic remark. Uh, so I'm going to say generic. I'm just going to search. Um, so we could say uh, under uh, shared audio file montage, we will come over here and I have this kind of set up already, but we could say create generic marker. So what you want to do is often you'll see like the keyboard shortcut set up here. Click on edit shortcut. And once that the keyboard is set up, we can now come over here and I could capture the particular MIDI note message and hit okay. So I did that and I think if we go to transport, um, we could choose, uh, let's look for the other function and so enabled and move cursor to start a file. Okay, so we're gonna say under transport, we see move cursor to generic file. So we click on edit shortcut and then have that 
defined. So now when I'm playing, uh, let's say I go to the edit view, I can play from the beginning and let's say, okay, I'm playing along here. So let's say, now if I wanna drop markers in, I can just hit my MIDI keyboard and just drop those in. And then if I go back and hit the C1 key, I go back to the beginning of the project, just like that. So make sure under the uh, preferences, you know, that we go to, you first thing you wanna do is under remote devices for MIDI shortcuts, make sure it says MIDI shortcuts, define the input, uh, and then you could assign it into the shortcuts area. Okay, so we see the uh, X, the second question, the X-Touch has an arrow uh, array with uh, a button in the middle that toggles uh, the cursor buttons between navigating track clips and zooming. Uh, this works fine in Cubase Pro, but how do I set it up in WaveLab Pro? So it's kind of like a, almost like a compass where we have like north, south, east, west buttons and a button in the middle, just if we could visualize that. So what you need to do first off is when you're in Cubase, you wanna make sure that each of those buttons are transmitting different MIDI note messages. Um, so some controllers may be set up so that, you know, then we'll say the north, south, east, west buttons will you know, transmit a particular MIDI message. And then when you hit the button in the center that it changes the MIDI message that are being sent. So if that's the case, um, you know, once you hit the MIDI button in the center, it may just send different MIDI notes. So, and then you would assign those MIDI notes the same way. So often sometimes just hitting that, you know, just changes the particular MIDI notes. So it's usually not that that's toggling or sending a MIDI message, it's that is changing which MIDI notes that button is transmitting. All right, uh, third question with this. Um, there's an action in preferences, remote devices, global transport named activate jog mode. I interpret this as it should toggle between shuttle and jog mode. However, it behaves quite strange. Uh, when I press the button on the X-Touch, uh, it lights up and the transport controls, uh, uh, again, on the X-Touch are set to play. No playback starts uh, in WaveLab and the pink strip in the clips uh, section lights up, uh, denoting WaveLab's in jog mode. Uh, when I press the button again on the X-Touch, the button remains lit in the transport controls set to stop mode and the pink uh, strip in WaveLab turns off. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, so if I'm here, let me just go back. So um, let's say if I want to toggle this and I set up a keyboard shortcut and we can put this into um, our, our jog mode. So now when, um, so I'll just go ahead and read the rest of the question. In order to turn off the button, uh, WaveLab doesn't respond to the jog wheel, jog shuttle wheel at all. Uh, could this be a bug? It looks to me as if WaveLab returns the wrong message to the X touch. Uh, the buttons and wheel behave correctly well, almost in Cubase Pro. So I'm not sure if um, we have this kind of WaveLab has the ability. So a lot of times, you know, the X touch. And I think we discussed this in previous live streams. The X Touch is only transmitting one uh, a MIDI controller message, so it doesn't necessarily um, do varying amounts of that controller. So it's just transmitting that it's MIDI CC one twenty six or something like that when you move the jog wheel. So if we activate this, you know, the play doesn't play, but once jog is activated at this point you know we could we could choose to kind of scrub accordingly with the mouse so i didn't find a control <clears throat> excuse me i didn't find a control in wave lab to kind of vary that speed but i think that on the x touch itself it's not transmitting the very speed, you know, whereas this is, you do it slow, 
and can speed it up accordingly that you know since that controller is only transmitting either going forward or back but not how fast or how much it's going forward or the speed or rate that it's going backward that it may not work for that so once you activate this so i just hit the my control that i set up we see that we're in jog mode here and then once we have that off, we're in normal play mode. So that's kind of what it is doing with that. All right, and that was from Sven. Um, okay, so we had a question sent in. Let's see how we're doing on time. I think we're okay. Oh, all right. Um, all right, uh, so this is Alexander, please help. What do I need to do to see if my inserts are not as long as the second picture is the picture? I always wanna add an insert that shows me all of my plugins, like in the picture, uh, any option, I try to do this in category and the results are the same. I see only the long list of plugin instead of uh, reinstall Cubase, doesn't help. So in Cubase, uh, what this is, is, say we go to your audio track and we go to inserts and we see, we see our list here. So all you have to do is click on the plus or the minus key here, and that will expand or collapse the, the between the two views, just like that. All right, so with that, I know we're a little bit over time. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I wanna thank everyone for all the wonderful questions. I hope that everyone has learned a trick or two. Uh, sorry that we're just a little bit over time. Uh, but we'll again meet on Friday and everyone, uh, please send in, uh, an email or, you know, I'll, I'll post the zoom meetup info, but I want everyone to stay safe and healthy and look forward to seeing everyone on Friday. Take care.